Good afternoon and welcome to the subcommittee on planning dispositions and concession. I'm council member Ben Kales, chair of the subcommittee. We're joined by council member Andy King and Ruben Diaz Sr. Uh, thank you to Ruben Diaz Sr. for always being the first one here. Today we'll be holding five public hearings and we'll be voting on a number of projects. Our first hearing will be mm -hmm. on the land use item 102, the Virian Gardens application for property located at 1479, 1497 St. Mark's Avenue in council member Amphrey Samuels district in Brooklyn. HPD seeks Actually, I'm going to s swap it around, and uh, we will uh, s start with uh, land use item uh, 105, the NIHOP Van Buren Green application for properties located on seven blocks in Councilmember Cornegie's district in Brooklyn. HPD seeks amendments to previously approved urban development action area projects, UDAP, in order to avoid punitive taxes being imposed on future owners of, sorry, let me strike that. Uh, not punitive taxes in order to avoid taxes being imposed on the future homeowners of 10 two-family homes. A change to the project will allow HPD to reduce the land debt, bring the cumulative value of the subsidies below a level that incurs a mansion tax. Uh, a mansion tax is in New York City, any property uh, with a value over $1 million includes an additional 1% transfer tax over and above the existing New York State 1% transfer tax, which takes it from a 2% from a 1% tax to a 2% tax. The future homeowners will have incomes between 80% and 130% of AMI. Uh, I will now open the public hearing on land use item 105. Uh, and we have uh, uh, Lacey Tauber from HPD and uh, Lenny Seif. Seif? Seif, Lenny Seif from HPD. I now will ask the council to uh, swear you in. Please state your names. Lacey Tauber, HPD. Lenny Seif, HPD. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee in response to all council member questions? Yes. yes, I do. We also have a representative from the sponsor here. I think he's filling out the form, but he's gonna join us on the panel. Okay, Sorry, we will that. ask him to complete that form. In the meantime, do you have a copy of your yes. written testimony okay. to be entered into the record? Uh, um, you may hand it up because I see that our Sergeant at <laughs> Arms is otherwise occupied. Thank you. All right. And if the uh, sponsor can join you at the table and we'll take your name and uh, swear you in as well. Oh, oh here. Larry. We have Larry Hirschfield, uh, the developer. Uh, and I will ask the council to swear you in as well. Please state your name. Larry Hirschfield. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee and in response to all council member questions? Yes, I do. You may begin. Okay. Uh, land use item number 105 consists of the proposed amended project for the disposition of seven city-owned sites located at block uh, 1791, lot 17, 18, and 19, block 1814, lot 15, Block 1852, lots 8 and 9, and Block 1641, lot 68, known as Van Buren Green, in Brooklyn Council District 36. On June 8, 2016, the Council approved an amended UDAP for the Van Buren Green new construction project, given the original proposal to develop sites under the new foundations program stalled during the 2008 economic downturn. Therefore, the decision was made to complete the project's construction under HPD New Infill Homeownership Opportunities Program, or NIHOP, uh, term sheet. The project comprises 10 two-family homes for a total of 20 units. Construction is anticipated to be completed for the first group of homes this summer, and end purchasers have been selected for nine of the 10 homes. Uh, targeted household income for home buyers uh, ranges between 80 to 130% AMI. Each home will have a rental unit that will be affordable to families earning no more than that same AMI as the purchasing homeowner. The estimated development cost of the project is um, about $7,500,000. Purchase, pri purchase prices for the homes range between $407,000 uh, 
uh, to 439,000 at the 80 to 90 percent AMI tier, and 605,000 to 623,083 at the 110 to 130 percent AMI tier. Currently, the project summary re requires further amending in order to address an unforeseen issue related to the New York State Mansion Tax. Accordingly, when the total consideration or contract price, which includes subsidized sales price, plus all subsidies and land value, exceeds $1 million, it triggers a surcharge to the ordinary New York State transfer tax of 1% of the total consideration, the minimum, minimum of which is $10,000. This surcharge is a burden to low income and purchasers, increasing down payment and closing costs. To avoid subjecting purchasers to the mansion tax, HPD is submitting an application to amend the current public approvals to obtain authorization to reduce land debt to lower the total consideration under $1 million. Other aspects of the project will remain unchanged. Do we have testimony from the developer? I'm prepared to answer various questions. I could only add that uh, deep affordability is the goal of this project and any undue additional expenses uh, on behalf uh, that will be incurred by the home buyer will lessen the affordability and in that uh, I'll say that the true price is to the buyer is below a million dollars. I, I, I think that uh, the relief should be granted. This is targeting at uh, individuals making 130% of AMI. Uh, these are three and four bedroom units, so at the 130% AMI, what income is that? We have a rate from 80 to 130%. Um, I don't actually have income figures in front of me. I don't know, oh, you've got them over there. Uh, this is uh, Lenny Seif from HBD. So of the 10 two-family homes, three of the homes achieved deeper affordability between 80 and 90% AMI adjusted based on family size. The other seven of the 10 homes uh, are affordable to folks between 120 and 130% AMI. And your question is about the income equivalence to those aforementioned AMI bands? So can a single person apply for these hou this housing? Um, we apply in the marketing of, uh, of these homes. We have occupancy standards that apply. So the occupancy Minimum standard. is one person so one per person bedroom. Get, okay. And the max is two persons per bedroom. Um, so for a family of three, for a three bedroom at 130% of AMI, what is the income? 80% of AMI for a family of three, based on the updated numbers, is... Uh, $75,120. And then for the 130%? Um, for 130, it's 122,070. And that is considered deeply affordable? It is considered affordable for our home ownership program and this is consistent with our term sheet for this, for this particular program. Okay, that's correct. And so you, you, you I, I heard the word mansion multiple times. Uh, these are, what makes these mansions? Yep. The mansion tax, which is uh, an emotionally charged a appellation, particularly in context of affordable housing, is, is triggered arithmetically. You take the subsidized sales price or the cash price to the end purchaser and you add in the city subsidy which is 70,000 per DU or, or $140,000. Then you add in the state affordable housing corporation grant funds, which are between 25 and uh, 32.5 uh, per unit. And then you add in pro rata subordinate land debt. And when you hit the button on the Excel machine, the aggregate comes out over a million dollars. So when the folks fill out the real estate transfer forms, it automatically triggers a surcharge to the transfer tax, which is called a mansion tax, which is 1% of that total amount. So if the total consideration is, you know, a million one hundred, it's going to be a minimum a $10,000 extra 
um, burden to these working class folks who have dedicated themselves to saving for down payment and closing costs. So, you know, it's just not acceptable. Um, so in the short term, the project, um, as some of the other folks may not know, is cooked, nearing completion, has been successfully marketed. We're kind of proud of the project, excited about the project, first time home buyer opportunities. And then when this issue with this 1%, this extra 10,000 bucks, that an end purchaser would have to pay, when that crystallized and became an issue, we, we needed to do something, and that's why we're here before the council with this amended uh, project, the to give, give us that tool. And so folks are able to purchase something uh, worth $1,100,000 for $407,000. You mean the cash price to the purchaser? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If I could add to that. Yeah, go ahead. Make, make sure you speak into the microphone. Sorry. The, the city requires that when they, they convey property, have what they, uh, I, I that, yeah, these are that they do an internal appraisal. And if it's conveyed for an amount that's less than their internal appraisal, they add on uh, this soft second mortgage. Uh, the goal, the city's goal, um, I should really work for HPD, but um, it, is that these buyers uh, stay in the home long term and that this soft second is never paid no. okay. and it does evaporate over time. So for example, if the home buyer sells, I uh, um, don't know that I remember the years exactly, within a few years afterwards, they ha actually have to pay that soft second back. But the longer they stay in the home, and I think it's up to 20 years or so, uh, then it fully evaporates. So it, it, it is a function of how the city conveys property, but these are buyers who are, cannot afford more than a certain level and it's targeted towards them. And it, it, it is really, as Lenny says, a function of how you put these numbers in the system, but they are being conveyed for that amount of money and they are for, uh, affordable to folks in those income ranges. 80% of AMI is, in, in my history with the agency, the lowest that I've seen home ownership projects. It's not deep affordability as a tax credit rental, but home ownership, it has been a floor of eight. And and I just wanted to clarify, I may have misspoke. Um, hopefully I didn't. But the mansion tax or the transfer tax surcharge is 1% of the total consideration for, for the home, for the end purchaser. I, I, I think that was clear. And oh, that was clear? Okay. I, I think so, and so I just wanted to be careful. I, at the four hundred and seven thousand mark, we're looking at at least six hundred thousand dollars in subsidies, and uh, is that same six hundred thousand uh, applicable to the four bedroom units no. as well? I'm sorry. I, I, so for the three bedrooms, and I, I'm just doing math here and asking you to confirm. So sure. In, so if the mansion tax is only triggered at a million dollars, oh, yes. if you're charging four hundred and seven thousand dollars for the home. Correct. Then that means that there's six hundred thousand dollars in subsidies that are being recognized. But the subsidies is also a function. You know, the mansion tax is attached to the to the home. The subsidies are attached to the units. I think the confusion might be about whether it's a per unit subsidy or for the development as a whole. That's no, it's uh, it, this is so this is per unit. If I could answer. Sure. Okay. Uh, so the homes are being they're all two family homes. Nine of them are uh, three, but the owner's unit is three bedrooms in one of the houses because uh, a change in zoning uh, had to go up a story and became a four bedroom. Mm. Um, but the homes that were priced at 80 and 130% AMI, and we had to make judgments as to which homes uh, would sell also based on the size of the rental unit and the location. So the, the price of the buyers in the, for these homes range between uh, in the 400,000s to the high, and the high end to the low sixes. So the subsidies then are between four and, four and 600,000. Okay, and so if a person is, uh, is making 120, so somebody's watching at home, they just found out that they can get a two, <coughs> Uh, a, a two-family home, a, a three-bedroom home for, uh, from the city for uh, 40 cents or so on the dollar. 
so they make $122,070 a year. They, how much do they have to put down as a down payment and how much to close? Contract deposits. Yeah, I mean, um, it depends on the mortgage product. Um, it can be 5%. Uh, we generally work with marketing agents that have a lot of knowledge of the end loan world. So, so they need, they need $20,000 cash to buy one of these. Five percent. There's closing costs as well. There's 5% down mm -hmm. in, in many cases. And then there are closing costs as well that they have to have to get to the closing table. Is, is that correct, Larry? That's about right. So, so how much are the closing costs for the $20,000 down payment? Are those numbers? I don't have that number in, in my, in my it head. It could easily be another 5000 We can get back to you, but exact numbers. I would also add that the affordability requirement uh, applies to the rental unit. So mm. that the home buyer uh, is getting a great deal, but they're required to uh, rent the rental unit to an occupant that's at the same affordability level uh, that they're buying at. So th the person who's purchasing, they're getting a three bedroom, and then how much is the one rental unit? Is that a one bedroom or a studio? Those are studios and ones. And what is the AMI target for those it's one bedrooms and studios? The, the percentages go hand in hand with the home buyer's percentage. So they're 80% uh, and 130%. So for the 80% band, how much is it? And for the 130% band, how much is it? Can you bring up those Can figures again? Yeah. yeah. You want the rental amount or the income, uh, the dollar, or the, the income the, amount? So if, if somebody's watching at home uh, and they mm -hmm. are at 80%, at what is the 80% income? Uh, oh, I thought you were asking Christian. about the rent. I, I will ask about the rent next. Okay. <laughs> we can do it in whichever I-, I For I, one person, 80% um, of AMI is $58,480. 58480 now, now, correct me if I'm wrong, but half of New York City makes almost half, is, is that makes less than $30,000 a year. So half of the city can't afford it at the 80% level. Well, I think that this is, as he was saying, the home ownership, because it has this, these requirements for a certain amount of money down, et cetera. Um, what, and and what's the rental amount? For, the, for a one bedroom? For the one bedroom. At 80%. Mm -hmm. um, that would be 1509 And then at the 130%, how much do you need to make for that one bedroom? 2487 2487 is the rent? Uh, I mean, this is approximate, and it's calculated about at 30% of the income you know, at these AMIs. And this is in uh, what part of Brooklyn? Bedford Stuyvesant. I, I would say that your one bedrooms are competitive with uh, Upper East Side one bedrooms at the 130% affordability market rate. Um, so uh, on that, so and how much do you have to make in order to qualify to pay $2,487 a month for a one bedroom in Bedford Stuyvesant? 2000, that was the 130 AMI? Yes, what's the... For, uh, for one person? Yep. Uh, 95,030. So that is, that is three times more than the average, than, than half of New York City makes. And so the mortgage on uh, $360,000 is, and, and let's just call it at 4%, but do you know what the interest rate is going to be? Is it 4% or... Is it lower? Do, will the buyers get a, a subsidized mortgage or not? Um, hopefully, a mortgage with favorable terms. Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't call it a subsidized mortgage per se. Okay, so let's just say they're paying more than market because let's say they have lower credit, so they're paying four percent interest on three hundred sixty thousand. 
So their monthly payment for a two family will be $1,719. Is that accurate? That sounds about right. That sounds and right. their income at the lowest AMI is going to be $1,509 and $1, a month. So they will only have to pay $210 out of pocket every month. And then for the higher AMI, um, it's th they will actually be making $700 a month. I, I can't keep up with your calculations. Mm -hmm. I just did three, three hundred sixty thousand dollars. I mean, respectfully, I no, can't. it's fine. Yeah. I, uh, so, on a three hundred sixty thousand dollar mortgage, four percent interest over thirty years, the payment is one thousand seven hundred nineteen dollars a month. Uh, and so, if your rental income is two thousand four hundred eighty seven a month, then it seems that two hundred. Twenty-five hundred dollars minus seventeen hundred is is eight hundred dollars. I, I rounded down to seven hundred dollars that they'll have an income per month. But the the ed, I take it that that math makes sense. But the ed loans are sized since two thousand and eight. With uh, before two thousand and eight, there was pity reduction, which meant you took uh, your basically your expenses and you did exactly what you did, which was subtract the rental income, and that's how much you had to make. After 2008, where the bank said you made a big mistake, they changed mm -hmm. the calculations so that the rental income is added to the home buyer's income, it's not subtracted. So their, uh, so their mortgage is sized uh, based off their income, so it provides a little, a little bit of a boost, but not nearly what it did when you when you took did that math and just and just wiped it off the mortgage payment, and then so you need forty thousand dollars down to buy one of the uh, four hundred thousand dollar units. What is the asset cap? For all things, I wasn't ready to answer. Today, What's that? But we'll get to it. It is. It's a hundred. It's a. I'll give you the. Um, the answer I have back in my head, it's 175% of the AMI for a family of four plus a down payment. But I'd need to translate that into discrete dollars for you, I'm if sure, you, right? You, yes, please. Um, well, I'll have, to get back, I'll have to get back to you on that unless it's in our, our sheet in front of me. But that it is a fixed asset cap, and it is, as I mentioned, 175% of AMI family of four plus the down payment. I, I will if, if yeah. you if you can look into that number and yes. so the the reason we are dealing with this okay and then the the other question just well, I have lots and lots of questions uh, so you have the per unit subsidy so it, and, and so I guess one question I, I got is uh, of this six hundred thousand dollars in subsidies how much is the city going to get paid back in 20 years? Well, uh, I think as the, the, uh, the sponsor was mentioned before, the, uh, the pro, pro rata, the, the construction subsidies from the city and the state and a portion of the land get, debt gets attached to each home with an enforcement note of mortgage at the end loan closing. And if the, and the debt, and if the owner, the debt is, uh, in place for 20 years, it does not reduce. Is that correct? It stays, it stays level. Um, if the owner tries, if the owner wishes to refinance uh, in years one through five, or sell, they you know uh, they ha they would they're obligated, compelled to pay back 100 percent of any appreciation realized from resale or profit. That's how we, that's a di disincentive to speculation. So year 21, how much do they have to pay back? Uh, zero. Okay. And so of the, so this project, now in your testimony you noted 2008 in the economic downturn. My understanding is that Van Buren Green started in 2007 prior to the 2008. That's when the project was awarded through a competitive process. That's correct. So it was awarded in 2007. 
Yes. Okay. Why did it take 11 years to close and why did it take until 2018 for us to be in a place where people could purchase and occupy? That, that's a fair question. So um, 2008, the, the, the world changed with respect to the economy. There was no appetite for home ownership. There was an overhang of foreclosure. Banks would not provide any construction financing, and it was uh, very difficult, if not impossible, to get an end loan. So that overhang didn't dissipate right away, and uh, I, I can't remember exactly when, but maybe in 2013 or 2014, we reached out to, to various developers that were awarded projects under, under the old home ownership program that stalled, and we gave them the opportunity to, uh, to resurrect and resume development if they could demonstrate interest and capacity. And that's something that uh, this, this gentleman was able to do. We closed the project in 2016 after solving various issues and getting the financing in place. There was some still, there's still residual, or there was in 2016, skittishness as it relates to for sale housing. Uh, but we did close, and we do have a successful project. I think construction proceeded at a decent pace. I would say that this is infill development, and there's properties and structures on either side of these tax lots, which is a challenge in itself with underpinning and foundation issues. And this is a um, poster child for a, uh, for a scattered site project where you lose some of the efficiencies with respect to mobilization, et cetera, that you might have with a, a, a mid-rise building. So I think all in all, I think the developer's done a, a good job. The construction, the project is being construction monitored. We're all about, paramount is quality construction, quality affordable housing. And so ELH management has been on this since they won the bid in 2007? Correct. Yeah. The, the project literally was awarded under the old New Foundations pro uh, program, and literally, uh, home ownership came to projects really came to an end, except in maybe very select neighborhoods. There were no end loans, and the banks went through this rethinking process where they eliminated the pity reduction, and they they played with other calculations as part of the affordability. They, it went to sleep, and then then we also had a new mayor who uh, came out with new term sheets, reduced the affordability, and then we had to re -UDAP the project. So we're, once we once HPD and, and I decided, okay, we can do this, then there was the process. Do you have any other projects that date back more than three years that still haven't become occupied? I could, well, I could tell you uh, that when I was, I was awarded four projects around that time. Two of them were large, uh, larger for sale projects that where the city came to me uh, a number of years, closer to 2008, said, you're just gonna do these as rentals. And they've been done, and they've been done very successfully, large multifamily. When I was awarded this project, I was uh, awarded another 10 sites uh, also, but those are in Brownsville, where the home ownership market for homes uh, will not support, given the level of subsidies currently offered, home own, new homes. Uh, so we're in conversation now with HPD is whether or not they should, that should go forward as a multifamily. I did have them redesigned as multifamily, whether it could be a multifamily rental or an affordable co-op. So that's an ongoing conversation, right? That's correct. So what's the location for that and how do we get that project out of sleep? At, wait, how do we wake that project up and, and not just leave? We, we've, we've woken, if that's the right, <laughs> is, that, is that a word, woken? woken. The project is awake and- um, It's not out of bed, it's rest. It's, it's in its pajamas and we're- uh, So we're gonna see it in July? We're, we're, it will enter more active pre-development in July. Pre-development, okay. we still have a lot of decisions to make regarding typology, what the market can bear, availability of construction financing, for, for sale housing in, in, in this particular neck of the woods. So that's what we're working on. We have project manager assigned 
um, and that we plan to pick up the pace on that activity in July. What are the hard costs on this project? The hard costs are, uh, you know, well north for, for this. Well, in the multifamily version, where we're are, well are you north of this project or the the other the Brownsville, Brownsville one, one? The, the the existing project. Existing project. Um, the hard costs. Uh, we closed this at a loss based on the money spent years ago. So they're under two hundred dollars a foot. Then they're costing us well over. So the hard cost just for construction and, and what have you is $200 a foot uh, for how much total? Uh, do you have high square footage yeah. in front of you? Uh, the total development cost is estimated around um, 7600000 $7, So what would be the hard cost of that? The hard costs are around uh, $5.5 million. Okay, and then what are the soft costs? $2 uh, million? I don't it's about a million, million bank interest. Uh, we would also include architect fees and big fees, sometimes considered hard costs, but not construction. Um, and, and what was the value of the Article 11 you received during construction uh, and didn't have to pay any taxes? So you had a tax abatement from 2007 to today. Well, we didn't own no, the, the Article 11 was... It, it, was not implemented until not so long ago. I don't have the exact. I think actually there was an old UDAP exemption uh, which was pulled after we closed and then I had to pay back that money. So you've been, you're paying taxes on the construction site because I think in the materials received it said you weren't paying taxes until the units became occupied. The real estate taxes. That's correct. Uh, I think we ultimately, once we closed, we got a new, we got a new exemption. My, my uh, recollection is there was an amended project that included an Article 11 tax exemption. Yeah, the, it says here the project was awarded an Article 11 tax exemption during the construction and marketing period, along with the UDAP tax exemption for the end purchasers. So it's two separate kinds of things. Okay, so for the first tax exemption, so it sounds like, at least according to HPD, you weren't supposed to be paying your back taxes because you, from 2007 till now, you didn't have to. Well, we didn't, right. we didn't, the, the, this gentleman's company didn't own the property until we closed in 2016. Okay. So, so it was all city owned, owned, there were no taxes owing. Okay. Uh, I, in terms of the land value, I'm seeing 322, is the, what is the land value per house? The subordinate debt is 300 and, uh, round, rounding up, my eyes are. $382,000 per two-family home. Is that a 2007 valuation, a 2016 valuation, a 2018 valuation? Is it based on vacant land or based on the property with the building on it? I th that would, um, in terms of the date of the uh, uh, the appraisal, I'd, I'd have to get back to you on those. I don't want to give you any misinformation. Um, we're, we're voting on this today, so yes. we need the answers. Okay. We, we may have done the um, appraisal when we came back for the amended project. If there was a mayoral hearing, we would have done an appraisal when we last came back. In 2016. Yes. So okay. that, that answers that question. And that's based on the vacant land or? That's improved? based on the as-is, highest okay. and best use. I, uh, The original city council resolution was approved on June 8th, 2016, yes. so all of okay. the records should be accessible. We, we were joined by council member Lander and uh, uh, council member uh, Andy King has a question. Thank you, Chair Kalos. Uh, appreciate your talents and your information on today's hearing. Um, to the developers, um, I wanna thank you and commend you for the energy and wanting to develop and help build New York. But I do have one or two questions that I'm just gonna be the first grader in the room because I just need to understand what you're talking about. Because um, you've asked for uh, some liens on the New York State mansion tax. You asked for the leniency to, so we can just forgive it and so you don't have to engage in that. I understand that. But I just wanna understand what, 
what do you think the purpose of this tax was originated for by the state? What was the purpose of it altogether? And I, I, I want to understand um, as why you believe it should be exempt. Um, who is building the houses? Is the developers building the house or the homeowners? Because as I hear you talk about how it's going to be a burden on the homeowners, I just right. want to understand how does that play out because if you're building the property, if you purchased the property and you're responsible for building on it, how do you transfer that million dollar tax, how you transfer it to the homeowner who is not even in the house right now, if they're not even building the property, you're the one responsible for building. I mean, you're responsible for everything. So how do you pass that on to the person who is going to come in, own the home or either rent in the home? So I just, just need to get clarity on that. I mean, I, on the first part of your question, I would, I mean, I don't, want to comment on what the tax is for but i can tell you what it's not for and that's okay. affordable housing and that's why we're here today because we believe that you know what we're trying to do is make sure that we can keep the cost down um so that these income the the properties can be income restricted and that folks at these certain incomes can afford to buy these properties and so you know we're here today to try to get to make sure that that tax isn't passed on to those folks um, as far as how that would work, um, I, I would. Well, it, uh, it, is, uh, it is a tax for the buyer. It's not for the developer or the seller. It, it's our concern because we're trying to create affordable housing and not create an additional burden for the, for the buyer. Uh, also, based on the, the post-2008 underwriting, mm -hmm. uh, the standards are very rigorous. So any additional burden is uh, is an extra hardship. In terms of what the tax is for, uh, it is, it's called the mansion tax, and, and I, I think that uh, at some point somebody said, well, if, if someone can afford a million dollars for a house, then they can, you know, the government always needs money, let's, let's add this tax. Uh, and these are not the folks who can afford a, a million dollar house. They may be getting a million dollar house, but they can't afford a million dollars. So this is where I'm, this is where I'm, I have some concerns, yeah. and I'm not mad at the state. I'm not mad at you or you know anybody who's trying to build and <clears throat> help New York. But I understand that we do build tax laws in specific areas and property because in the state of New York, which transfers down to the city, you know, we need certain funding in certain areas require certain taxes that they put in place. So if we're going to build in certain areas that this is the tax code, how do we say, I want to build here, but I want to change the tax code because we're going to bring in people who can't afford. And I listened to my chair. You know, as President Clinton said, the, the, you know, the arithmetic, the math doesn't lie. So if you have numbers that don't equate to pe what people are earning to what you're selling to them, they're saying this is what it's going to cost them, and it's going to still leave them with $800 to try to figure out how to live, something is off with the numbers. So I'm just trying to help help. You help yeah. me understand let me, your selling point on why we support this, why we should support this project. Our, our selling point or our messaging is, I think it's the manner in which this uh, transfer tax is calculated. It uh, this surcharge, the transfer tax, it's not just based on the cash price to the end purchaser. We talked about that. If the house sells for four hundred thousand, there wouldn't be any mansion tax. If the house sold for six hundred thousand to the end purchaser working class, New Yorker, income restricted, there wouldn't be no mansion tax. But when the Department of Finance, um, uh, working with these transfer forms, when they count the subsidies, the subordinate land value, and the construction subsidy that the city puts in the project, and the construction subsidy that the state puts in the project as a grant, that's what inflates the, the contract price uh, above a million dollars. So we think, and I, uh, I'm not a lawyer, and I, I would think we'll pursue a legislative remedy maybe in the summer, but it's probably the manner in which the, the basis is calculated, on which the mansion tax is based, is something that we have an issue with, that we don't think is equitable. We don't think is the intention of the mansion tax. So that would ask you to go back to the state to find that out because as I'm listening to you, yes. the mansion tax only kicked in after all these all this funding came in and it that's and it, correct and it kicked in. So at that point, I'm just listening to your conversation. Even if those numbers went over a million dollars, how do you transfer it back to the homeowner who that that wouldn't be able to afford? Why wouldn't it come out of the grants that are came, that are coming to you? It's not coming to the homeowner; it's coming to you. Well, here, here's. 
So this is a two-part answer. Okay. Also to your first question. Okay. Really, is it's sort of I, I'm going to call it, it. It's like an imaginary subsidy. It's a requirement that HPD their pack design. I'm not getting it. Um, it's not going to me. It's it's just something. Who's it going to? It's going to nobody. It, it's. Er uh, it, it'll go to HPD if, if the home buyer, uh, I, look, I have more, I, I participate in a variety of HPD programs. Okay. They, they give me soft mortgages. Some of them basically say you pay no interest, you pay uh, no principal, and in 30 years this, this mortgage will evaporate. Sounds um, like dividends. No one can explain it. Right, you can't explain it. But I, I can tell you, this. so if nobody gets this money, the city will get the money, that's not the intention, if the, if the home buyer sells or refinances in less than 20 years. But it will also say that you know the numbers don't lie. I'm not involved in the HPD appraisal process, but I know from time to time that I, I am involved if I'm the buyer, and I, and I sometimes have uh, some discover mistakes or there's disagreements, or sometimes people might say, well, you know, price, prices are really inflated right now, and that's being reflected in these appraisals, and, you know, in two years when mortgage rates are up and, and prices are down, appraisals would be less, and HPD might appraise a property at that time, and, it, and the subsidy might then be uh, at a level where it's less than a million dollars. So it's really a funny mechanism that, that's uh, more art than science, and nobody's getting the money. Okay, but you're asking us to make a decision or something that you're saying that's a phantom? But I'm trying to understand. I'm, I'm just trying to understand. Well, I'm, yeah. I'm I mean, just I asking you to understand that because that you're not period. giving it to the homeowner, Nobody but you're saying that no one's getting the money, but you're asking us right. to relieve you of this responsibility when you're saying it, does, it doesn't really it exist, but it doesn't exist. I, there's no cash. Let's say this. There's no cash be, uh, being generated or moved around or going to anybody. But your selling point was to put it on the homeowner, though. That's what I'm saying. You make it seem like the homeowner's going to be in distressed if this if this happens. But you're saying it doesn't really happen because it doesn't. It's just in the air, but it doesn't really have any substance. It's an HPD. No, what's what's real is the tax, but it's based on a, a, a number of dollars that are put on paper as part of this conveyance, which is an HPD requirement when they sell property that they appraise it, and they then call that a. They create a soft subsidy, but no dollars are changing hands for that part of the subsidy, which is significant. But I think the point is that at the end of the day, what we are asking, the tax is real, and it will be passed on to the homeowners if we're not able to get this project summary updated. And what we're trying to do is make sure that we can keep the cost down for the end purchasers of these units, because we want them to be affordable um, to the folks who are buying them. I guess my last question would be is, why would it be passed down to the homeowners? I didn't get that answer, that's what I'm asking again. It's why would it be passed down to the homeowners? It's passed down to, it, it, it is a function of uh, purchasing property for over a million dollars. We're not passing it down, it is a function of the tax law. Okay, dividends again, Wall Street crash, I understand. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council Member King, and uh, but we will continue to fight this together and just make sure the public has an idea of what, what's going on. So uh, the, in 2016, you did an appraisal. It came out at 300, sorry, give me one second. When you did the appraisal, it came out at $382,000 per house. Now you've got this mansion tax problem. Uh, you, your intent is to have approval to lower the land value? That is correct. Okay. How would you lower the land value? Well, the objective is to lower the total contract price under a million dollars. So, we, um, so, we, so that would be one consideration. We'd probably also take into account the post-construction appraised value and loan-to-value issues that may come up in terms of the end loan uh, from the end loan provider. So we're amending the public approvals. And basically, we're asking for the authorization to reduce the land debt to make sure that the total consideration is under a million. And where does that land debt go? The, the land debt will be attached to the project. Okay. The reduced land debt. 
So, so somebody hands you a pile of three hundred eighty-two right. dollar bills, and and so you're saying, well, because we took three hundred eighty-two thousand dollar bills, we we have to change how much of those yeah. dollar bills we accepted. So, what are you? How are you going to change it from three hundred eighty-two thousand? Are you just going are you to talking say, about in terms of the documents? In terms of how we're going to transact that change, yes, we may put we may put a balance of the land value into a into an, a grant agreement and use that as an instrument. Um, is, is, that's one path. Okay, so so there are three there there are, are two certainties in life: death and taxes. Correct. Uh, and and so, how do you get around? So, so, so the IRS could be watching us right now. How do you get away, uh, and, and New York State Tax and Finance could be watching right now, or, or likely is, it's public information. Yes. So, so how does New York State Tax and Finance look at this hearing and say, one day there was a mansion tax, and then the next day they changed their document filings to eliminate a tax burden uh, that was there in 2016, but in 2018 they got permission to do something different so that now they don't owe us those $10,000. How does that work? Well, I can tell you that we're here at the, with the guidance of our, our legal department. They're the ones, that is the entity that told us that we have the prerogative, regulatory or statutory, to reduce the land debt only, not the construction subsidies. Um, that we have that prerogative, okay, we have so that legal. That so you're legal. not going to just revalue. So are you revaluing it and saying, you know, we in 2016 we were wrong, and despite appreciation and inflation and the fact that the market's gone up, that that we're going to go with a lower value? How do you not have to do a new appraisal at the transfer anyway? That's a good question. I, I um, we're going to again. The objective is we're going to reduce the land debt to get us under that million dollars. Um, we may use a grant agreement if that's something we can do and move some of the land debt out of, a, out of the recorded enforcement instrument into a forgivable grant agreement. Um, frankly, it's something we have to discuss with our lawyer uh, in July. And I mean, the, the reason that we're here in front of the council is because we need um, authorization to do this reduction of land debt. You know, it's not something that's happening behind closed doors. We're here right. in a public hearing to discuss it with you, explain the issue, and ask for your authorization to move forward with this process. And, and so just to, to be clear, regardless of whether you decide to forgive the debt and, and or you decide to set it aside as a separate grant, the purchaser is still going to get something that the New York State tax law says is a mansion. No, no. The, the whole purpose is to have the have this tool in our toolkit be able to reduce this pro rata land debt. So, so when we when we reduce this and the person decides to sell it, they are not going to be able to. Uh, it, it won't have a value in excess of a million dollars. They'll have to pay off their enforcement uh, mortgage, whatever but that. But you're reducing whatever, that what, enforcement what, mortgage. We're reducing that enforcement mortgage by this. By at least by some thousand dollars. By say again. By at least a hundred thousand um, dollars. We have to get it under a million, whatever whatever that might take. Okay. At so, minimum. So just to, I think to answer Councilmember King's uh, question, so this ends up being a dish. So there's going to be a lottery for these ten units, and a bunch of folks who make one hundred twenty-two thousand dollars a year will uh, get these and following our action, if they sell or when they sell, they will have a reduced amount that they have to pay back if they sell in the first 20 years. I'm gonna turn it back to Council Member King. So I just wanna ask this, I, I thank you for that yes. clarity. Uh, I'm scratching my head on it still. But what happens in an area such as this one that the property is valued more than the houses that are on there? So even though if you're saying the houses are 120,000, whatever it is, and then the property around there still value at a million, whether it's next door or two doors, how does the person in there still survive the taxes that come in that community that they have to pay? I'm trying to understand that one. 
Because I, I have a home, and regardless, my taxes have changed due to the property value because of where I live. Whether it was busted because of the, 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 the crash, and then as things come up, my taxes have adjusted on me. So if you're saying to me in the neighborhood right now that you want to leave us with this millionaire tax yeah. uh, because the, that, that's the land mass in that community, even though you take a parcel of it out and build housing that's less, that still doesn't devalue the property that's around it. So I'm trying to understand what will happen to those homeowners who are in there who build, who buy these houses that you've you've built, but someone around the corner has a house that's worth 1.5 million. I'm just trying to understand. If, if I'm wrong, someone explain it to me now, please. This is a one-time tax where the buyer buys it. It has nothing to do with ongoing real estate taxes or ongoing income tax. What will the assessment on these properties be for the people who move in? Will it be 400,000 purchase price? Will it be the million dollar that it's being transferred on or $999,999? What is their assessment and what is the tax rate that they will be paying when they move in? Erica, can you come up? Well, they're gonna, there's, a, um, there's, there's a UDAP tax exemption for the end purchaser. So when the end purchaser, and we have, uh, as was mentioned before, uh, uh, nine to 10 contracts are out. So when the purchaser get, moves in, they'll only pay taxes on land value for the first 10 years. And then in years 11 through 20, they'll, the, 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 the value of the improvements get factored back into the assessment, if that answers your question. Is it a full, exempt, is it a full exemption on the additional value? Or? For the first 10 years, it's a, fu it's a full exemption on, imp on the improvements. And then in years 11 through 20, the building value gets factored back in, in in equal equal increments. So for 10 years, they are set at 382,000 or whatever the new value you set the land to, and that's at 11 percent. Or that is up to the Department of Finance. They they have their own. They'll do the assessment, and it'll be a tax rate based on residential property class one. In this case, whatever that Un unimproved versus improved. Um, I don't know about that. I mean, I no. I think so, so, it's so taxes on land only. Um, when if the Department of Finance breaks the valuation into land and improvements, I don't. It's not always visible. If you go on their website, you don't always see that data. So, quick question to ELH Management because you've paid the taxes on the land only. To to answer my colleague's question, what is the tax going to be for the next ten years for these folks? Well, we paid it what it's going to be. I think it's minimal or, or nothing. They, they okay. had an Article 11 okay. tax exemption during the construction and marketing period, and then the end purchasers will have the UDAP tax. What is the value of the UDAP tax exemption? I, I think under the, uh, under the UDAP, more or less, the, the owners that will pay probably no more than $100 a month in, in property taxes. And what would their obligation otherwise be? They would pay taxes on the full assessed value, which as calculated by the Department of Finance, that would include land and improvements, be much, much higher. Much, much higher. It's an instrument of affordability. OK. Uh, I still have more questions on this. So I just hopped on Street Easy. Because Bedford Stuyvesant, like, I'm curious what real estate looks like in Bedford Stuyvesant. So, uh, if I wanted to buy the most expensive, uh, let me just, sorry, I was, I was, I'm gonna take off the limiter, but uh, there's a lot of property in this part of the city for less than six hundred thousand uh, dollars. If I wanted to buy the most expensive multifamily in Bedford Stuyvesant, uh, it looks like. 10 bedrooms, five bath, ma many, many baths is, is six million, but the, the average price is, is somewhere around less than a million. But so I guess the, the first issue is, let me just put the limiter on. I can buy, I believe, give me one moment. So there are 18 properties in Bedford Stuyvesant that have more that, that have multiple bedrooms, three bedrooms or four bedrooms. Uh, hold on, sorry. So I can get a uh, 
two bedroom, two bath, 938 square feet in Bedford Stuyvesant, multi level for $399,000. It's right. 253 Hall Street, number B. That's a co op. Is that a condo? or? That's a condo in Ocean Hill. Okay. That's. Easter. First of all, Ocean Hill is different from Bed Stuy. <laughs> Secondly, I, 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 I'm, I'm these going, are. Um, you no, know, we're talking no, two I family mean, homes with multiple right. bedrooms. Uh, three bedroom, I, one bath is three hundred eighty-nine thousand. So I guess I'm just trying to compare market to affordable, affordable, mm -hmm. and and I guess what I'm just seeing is the market right now in in Stuyvesant Heights, which is what, uh, and that was seven ninety-five Putnam Avenue, number two R, is just. It seems like even the affordable units seem to be somewhere around what the market is currently. I, I think you're looking at apartments that, um, if you look at homes, which is what we're selling here, um, with a rental apartment, uh, in, in what I'll call prime Bedford Stuyvesant, almost anything under a million uh, is going to be in original condition and need a lot of work. Uh, people are doing high end renovations at Bedford Stuyvesant, and some of them are going for over $2 million. Um, all right, I just want to stress again, so this, this program is, you know, meant to identify city-owned property. You know, there, there's, I think, a lot of push for HPD to identify land that we can develop as affordable housing. NIHOP is a program that does that with small lots that might not be appropriate for, you know, large multifamily housing, for example, that turns those city-owned lots into affordable home ownership opportunities for families. And so, you know, that's why it's income restricted. This is consistent with our NIHOP term sheet. It's a program we're using all over the city to try to increase people's access to affordable home ownership. I, I appreciate it. My concern is just whether or not it's actually affordable and whether or not anyone would actually choose this unit over over the market. Well, I, we I already am, have marketed these, and I think nine of the 10 already have folks ready to move in. I, I'm talking about the rentals, because I see 148 one bedrooms and studios for less than $2,487 a month. Uh, they, they actually start, if, if you need a, a one bedroom, uh, they start at around 1750 for for 11 Monroe Street. Uh, so it's just, we're saying it's affordable, but you're priced above market in Bedford Stuyvesant, so that's a question I have. I would say brand new construction will, will achieve the highest rents. It's high quality brand new construction. But the high quality new brand new construction that you're saying is, is affordable is at the upper end of <clears throat> Well, what We're I looking would say at 148 rentals, yeah. there's probably 10 or 20 that exceed your price, and the rest of the market is is far below your affordable units. I could say that this is an a, a statewide requirement, um, so to basically comply with the state, and it's an, it's an it, older requirement. Let me just add, the bank that did the underwriting um, provided these rents or accepted these rents, rents, and they were based on uh, rental comps at the time. Banks are, as you might imagine, very risk adversive, and they, they have no, there's no value inflating the value of the rents. Uh, the, the 1509 is, is on track with market, but again, I think there's something wrong with affordable housing that is at market. Well, I think that there's a lot of folks in the city that need a place to live, and these people can know that they're going to be paying 30% of their income toward their rent, which is not something that a lot of people in the city have the opportunity to do. So let's just, uh, so I guess I've been paying attention to a lot of these different projects. We're up to your, your land use item 105 in this committee. Mm -hmm. And this is by far the most subsidy I've seen on any project. So this is just what I've been asking. So let's just ask about how, how you built these units. Uh, so I guess the, the first question is, uh, 
when you built the, the units, did the people who did the construction, did they have health insurance so that they got hurt, they could go to a doctor or disability so that they couldn't keep working anymore, they would be able to be supported with their families? Um, my staff has health insurance, and, and we're general contractors, so uh, we're not aware of, uh, I think there's a, a range of subs benefits that they that they provide this is my is it important that the folks who put up your building have health insurance uh, it's a plus they're all covered but you know there's workers comp so on and so forth uh, have you ever tried to get covered under workers comp you mean make a claim yeah well, I'm, uh, I'm not eligible uh, as an uh, employer uh, it's important uh, we we had a lot of hiring requirements and restrictions. They did MWBE requirement, which we worked uh, hard to fill. Did you did you meet your MWBE requirement? Uh, we, we far exceeded it. We uh, what what percentage? I knew you were going to ask that. Um, we are at, for the MBE. We have it divided by M MBE and WBE. Uh, we are at three hundred and four percent of the requirement. Uh, and WBE we're at one hundred and seventy. And, and the requirement is? I have it in hard dollars. The, uh, the uh, MBE was 129,000, and we are at 1,796,500. And WBE was 59,000, and we are at 692,250, uh, which was the percentage that we should have done. But uh, we, we exceeded by about 60,000. And what was the uh, local hire? Local hire, we didn't have a specific target, but we achieved a uh, significant portion of that uh, through both the MWBE and then uh, relationships, sorry, developed uh, through community board uh, meetings, uh, et cetera. We gave a large carpentry contract for 600000 to a local carpenter. Uh, we have uh, in the electric corporation with a $30,000 contract, uh, mechanical contractor. Uh, and all of those employed people who lived in New York City and hired new people off the street from Bedford-Stuyvesant? Uh, we don't know that all of them do, but we believe that majority of them do. And I've been on the site and I've met many of the workers. Okay, and how many of the workers who worked on your site can afford to purchase one of these affordable units? Uh, I cannot give you a percentage. I would imagine that all the plumbers could and, and none of the laborers could. Uh, how much were they making an hour? Uh, I, as I said, we, um, as a general contractor, it's, it's not a prevailing wage job, so we're not privy to that information. So, so the majority of the workers on the job could not afford to live in the affordable housing based on what you paid them? Well, we, we pay a subcontractor, the subcontractors pay the, the workers. Uh, but you I could pick a subcontractor that would pay people a wage so that they could either afford to live in the city at market or they could afford to live in the affordable housing they're building. Well, not to comply with both the MWBE requirements and Remember, the construction subsidies would not allow it, and the soft subsidies that were just uh, the subject of this conversation uh, do not pass through to uh, you know, the builder, the contractor, or the subcontractor. Okay. Uh, those are all of my questions. Are there any other members of the public who wish to testify on this item? Uh, seeing none, uh, I will uh, go on to... I will close the public hearing on this item and move on to land use item 104. Uh, we have an opening statement from Council Member Brad Lander. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll, I'll be brief on this one. I know you have a long uh, agenda item. This deal, the Culver LDO, goes back many, many years. It was actually struck between then Council Member de Blasio, then Council Member Simcha Felder, about whom I'm not going to say anything today, despite his preventing us from having speed cameras in front of our children's schools. <laughs> um, uh, that counts. <laughs> and 
uh, SEBCO, Southern Brooklyn Community Organization, and, and HPD, uh, before I was in office back in, I don't know, 2008 or nine. Um, the deal reached the council for the first time in this committee, I believe, back in 2010. Uh, and I have the letter from then Deputy Commissioner Holly Light to me because at that time the deal had been totally underwritten. It's an affordable home ownership deal. It is therefore uh, above the affordability levels that we love to get down to. Uh, you'll hear it's at 90 and 110 percent, but still very affordable for home ownership. Uh, it had already been uh, essentially financed and worked out. SEBCO agreed and HPD agreed to double the affordability period, the period of time in which there would have to be repayment from sort of a first period of five years tapering down to 15 to a first period of 10 years tapering down to 30. Um, as you know, Mr. Chair, I'm a big fan of permanent affordability and in future deals, that's what I wanna see. Uh, but in this deal underwritten now, basically 10 years ago, doubling the affordability period uh, was something I was proud of. SEPCO has now built 36 of these units. It has taken a long, long, long time for reasons no one, not SEPCO, not HPD, not I, uh, are thrilled about, but we are thrilled that, we, that they're basically done and that they're ready to be sold, uh, and this is at the end of the project. Um, the, you'll hear that uh, there's an adjustment needed to the UDAP to prevent uh, additional tax burden from being placed on, on new homeowners or on the project. Uh, and I wholeheartedly support the project and the application that's before us today. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And what, what was going on with the uh, lots during this decade? Uh, these, this is a complicated set of lots, truthfully. It's a very narrow strip of land that used to hold the train tracks, the Culver L. So the lots are complicated. The transaction was complicated. The financing was complicated. Um, you know, both SEPCO and HPD can, um, can go into more details, but people were working hard, tirelessly over many years to get this done, despite the challenges at, at many steps along the way. Well, thank you. Uh, so I will read into the record some of the additional information that our Land Use Council would like me to read. Uh, this item is Land Use Item 104, the Culver L Phase 1 for properties located on 37th Street between 12th and 13th Avenue in Councilmember Landry's District in Brooklyn. HPD seeks a retroactive Article 11 tax exemption for taxes accrued in the past six years during the construction phase after the developer transfers the property to individual homeowners free and clear of the prior taxes. A new urban development action area project UDAP tax exemption pursuant to Article 16 of the General Municipal Law will go into effect prospect Prospectively, the units will be affordable to homeowners with income ranging from 80% to 100% of AMI. Uh, and so uh, if you can submit your testimony. And I will ask the general, the, the, the committee council to uh, uh, swear, your in, mm. swear you in. Please state your names for the record. Lacey Tauber. Abraham Jaffe from SEPCO. Lenny Seif, HPD. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you will answer all council member questions truthfully? Yes. I yes. I do. Ready? You may begin. All right. Lenny's item number 104 consists of an amendment to an exemption area designated for development under HPD's new foundations program for a new construction project known as Culver L Phase 1. The project is located at block 5295, lots 4, 104, 105, 106, 107, 108, 111, 112, and 113 in Brooklyn Council District 39. And on February 2nd, 2011, the City Council approved ULERP actions, allowing for the UDAP area designation, disposition, and project approval. The project closed in November 2014, and the estimated development cost is $16,831,542. Culver L Phase 1 comprises 36 condominium, condominium units within nine four-story buildings with a mixture of 16 three-bedroom and 24-bedroom units. Targeted household income will be 80 to 110 percent of AMI. It is anticipated that the sponsor will complete the first group of buildings this summer. During construction, the Department of Finance levied the building value on two of the nine buildings, resulting in an annual tax liability of approximately $60,000 per building, totaling $120,000 while the other seven buildings mm -hmm. were built at a nominal rate. 
Given the sponsor's budget does not include funds to cover this higher level of taxation, an Article 11 tax exemption request is being submitted in order to, to seek retroactive tax benefits commencing from 2014. The Article 11 tax exemption, of which net present value is approximately $978,151, with the cumulative value $1,100,543, will terminate when the last condominium unit is sold to the end purchaser. All end purchasers will benefit from the approved UDAP tax exemption upon expiration of the Article 11. Does the developer have any testimony? Only that uh, what we've been doing for the last 30 years in the city of New York is developing affordable housing within the neighborhood, concentrating on neighborhood preservation. And uh, this project is a long awaited, as Councilman Lander can attest, a long awaited project that we're happy that we're done. We're like 97% done on the project. We're beginning marketing, the marketing process. Any minute, Lenny? Um, and I'm prepared to answer any questions that the council will have. I'll turn to Councilmember Lander with the first round of questions. Uh, thank you. I don't really have questions here. I'll add one or two just uh, bits of information for the record. One is that there is no city subsidy in this project. The land was disposed for a dollar or a dollar per lot uh, to the developer, uh, but the city is not putting city subsidy in. And of course, it's not like an MIH development where there are market rate units and affordable units so that the you know, the affordability levels here are really being set by the cost of construction, uh, which is, you know, so I, you know, I for one would love to see us reach deeper le levels of affordability and permanent affordability, um, uh, but given where things were at the time, without an MIH program, without a city homeownership <coughs> subsidy program, uh, I think this project with just the land being given to SEBCO and them cobbling the deal together to enable affordability um, for families at the best price they possibly could, um, you know, that it's a deal I support and I support giving them this tax exemption. Um, I think your questions about how we want to do home ownership going forward are really good questions. And if we were working on this deal today instead of a decade ago, uh, and either the possibility of additional subsidy to get to deeper levels of affordability or cross subsidy by having market rate and affordable units would be great ways to think about this project, but given how long it's taken to get here and how hard they've worked to do it um, under the conditions that were granted, I remain a supporter and I hope you and the other members of the committee will vote yes. Thank you. Uh, for folks watching at home, uh, how much uh, do, what, what is the minimum, what is the maximum incomes for people who wish to purchase these three and four bedroom units, assuming uh, family sizes of three or four? Yeah, I have that. Um, for a family, uh, let's let's go with a family of four, if that's okay. Sure. Uh, on the low end, seventy-seven thousand eight hundred dollars. Uh, seventy-seven eight hundred. Is that based on the twenty seventeen number or the? Uh, no, these are the, these are based on the older AMIs. The new one. So the new one right, is eighty percent is eighty-three four forty, and the okay. one and the. Uh, oh. 100% is 104,300. The 110 is not on the chart. We'd have to figure it out. Uh, for a family of four? Yep. yep. Uh, for a family of four, 110. Oh, you're right. 110 is not on the chart. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I only have 100 and 130. Somewhere between <laughs> uh, 100, which is 104,300, and 130, which is 135,590. Give me one second. I will. I will run it myself. I have. Uh, I have one fourteen. Is that what you had? That's what I did. Okay. So, folks watching at home, your family of uh, between eighty-three thousand and one hundred fourteen thousand, and how much is a three-bedroom and how much is the four-bedroom? Uh, at the eighty percent level and the hundred and ten percent. The units range from the 329,000 and change for the low, for the three, uh, three bedroom uh, for an 80% AMI up to 526,170 for the four bedroom at the 110 AMI. Uh, sorry, can you repeat the number again? 400. It's 329,123 yep. and 526,170. Okay. 
Uh, and how much do they need to have down to purchase one of your units? We have a 10% requirement for the down payment. So somebody making $83,000 a year would need to have $32,000 in liquid assets. Sounds correct. And uh, do you know what the closing cost would be? Well, there are a lot of first-time homebuyer products that we're, I, we, we, as part of our agency, we have homeownership counselors who are working uh, with several different um, products that we're trying to put together. So they it would range, I would guess, I would guess we're talking about the $5,000 in closing costs, give or take. Okay, so um, if you're taking out a $300,000 mortgage at 4% over, 30 years, uh, you're, you're looking at about a, 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 a payment of $1,432 a month for the next 30 years. That's correct. For, for a three or four bedroom. We've been joined by council member Chaim Deutsch. Uh, and, and so you have somebody who is earning 83,000 a year, uh, at least right now they can earn more. Is that correct? Well, the asset cap, the asset cap on this project is at uh, 182,525. So they can technically have a larger down payment if they have one. Uh, okay. They can have family participation to affect that, uh, that down payment mm -hmm. if, if that's available. <coughs> if that's available. So the asset cap is, does make it easier for people to buy these units. Great. And so on a uh, three, at th on a three bedroom, a 30% of their income for somebody. So, so what would be affordable to them at 30%, so most of these folks will be paying roughly 15 or 20% of their income to the mortgage cost. Well, that's before the condo, the, the condo fee and the insurance. And then, you know, what is the condo fee estimated to be? I think with a property tax, so I think we're under $500 a month. Okay, so now it brings it up to around 20%. And so it doesn't, this, they will not have property taxes on this because of the Article 11 that we're granting. Is that correct? Well, or it's I, partial. Can I, can we're talking, are we talking about the end purchasers? Can I, yes. The, 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 the end purchasers have a UDAP. There is a UDAP uh, that's been approved for the, uh, for the end users. The Article 11 is for the developer during construction uh, because the Department of Finance did assess an as built value to two of the properties. And that, uh, that added burden is threatening the project. I think we should just take, a, just to clarify if, if, if it's required. So the project in its first go around was approved for disposition and was approved for an end purchaser UDAP tax exemption. And then we encountered this circumstance uh, July 2017 where the finance department imposed building value considerable building value on two of the nine identical buildings, resulting in a tax liability during construction prior to CFO of about $60,000 a year annually. And uh, these are uh, 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 amounts that are, are not, uh, there's no funds in the budget. It wasn't anticipated that uh, there would be building value that would have to be paid during construction. It was a surprise to everybody. And what were the uh, hard costs for this $16.8 million project? Do you have it back there? I, I don't think I have the, unless it's in I'm also order. interested in the soft costs. Oh. Well, we have the total development cost number that we can share, but we don't have it broken down. We appreciate the uh, 60 million, so that is why we have the developer who I believe is looking it up. Uh, while, while we are doing that, so, The, what is the land value for each one of the uh, nine lots or, or for the, the one lot that was subdivided? The land value, the land debt was um, about $650,000. So that prorated to the, to the nine buildings would be the pro rata land debt. See if I have any a figure that's more exacting, but I, I don't think I do. The previous figure we received was six hundred fourteen thousand. Yeah. So yeah. I don't that's know if six fourteen is 
accurate or 650. Yeah. 614. I think right. he just misspoke. Thank you. And then, so pro rata, that is $68,000 per land, per, per building, give or take? We have it per DU at 17055 uh, 17 times 9 does not equal no, 6. You divide it by 36. The number oh, these are, these are condos yes. with uh, yeah. a I don't rental have a per income as well? Saying, but per dwelling unit these are 9, 4 DU condo buildings. And each 36 D condo units. 36 condo units in total. Got it. Thank you. So it's 17 per DU? Correct. Yes. Okay, so we start off with, so that's actually a much lower subsidy than we saw on the last project. So 17,000 for the land view value. We're giving a retroactive article 11, which is going to total about $120,000. Mm -hmm. We are then giving an article 16 tax abatement. That is a full tax abatement moving forward um, the Article 16 tax exemption is the UDAP tax exemption mm -hmm. that is uh, will be provided to the end purchaser. That, and that benefit will be uh, accrued to the end purchaser, not to the developer. Okay, and so in your testimony, you're saying the net present value is 978,151, uh, but the cumulative is only about 200,000 more. Uh, what is the term of the Article 16? The term of the Article 16 for the end purchasers, yes. that's a 20-year exemption, 10 years full exemption on building value, mm -hmm. and then years 11 through 20, building, the building value is added back into the base assessment in, in equal increments. That number, the, the numbers that you said, though, that was for the Article 11. L let me speak to the Article 11 just for a second so we don't... So the so Article 11 is, oh, back over, sorry. On the Article 16, it's added back over the remaining 10 years, did you say? Or say again. Is it, the Article 16, is it a 10 year or 20, sorry. It's is it a 20, 20 year, year exemption. Perfect. It's a full exemption for the first 10 years and a reduced exemption over years 11 through 20. Uh, Chairman, I did get your hard costs and soft costs for you. The hard costs are uh, 13. It's about thirteen million seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars and change. Not the exact number. I'm looking at uh, bank documents, and the soft costs were about three thousand four hundred and ninety, uh, three million four hundred ninety-two thousand and four hundred or so. We we're talking about the different tax exemptions. So we have an Article 16. We have an Article 11. Uh, so let's start adding them together to get the the full. Of abatements. Well, it's a little bit different because, as we said, the Article 11 is for the developer for the term of construction, and the UDAP exemptions are for the purchasers moving forward. So they're really two separate things. They can't exist at the same time. <laughs> okay, so what is the value that we are giving the developer, and what is the value that we are giving the purchaser? The Article 11 will terminate I'll say it this way, when the last of the 36 condominium units is sold to an end purchaser. It's not a function of CO. So the Article 11 covers Sorry. construction and it covers marketing, I which is good. Construction and marketing, thank you. And marketing, Sorry. which is an important component because the project hasn't started marketing yet. Correct, Rabbi? That's right. Okay. Okay, so, and, and so, Okay, so where are you in the uh, construction process? So these are? We, we are at about 95% done. We're, we're paving and we're doing the last, uh, we're, at, but we're gonna be refinishing the, full, the, the hardwood floors and we, we're prepared. Uh, we've already begun the, uh, the, the CO process. We have in inspections going, uh, going on. So we're, we're, we're done. This is, uh, we hope to start the marketing uh, yesterday or the day before, right, Lenny? Uh, we're really, uh, we're, 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 you know, the... Okay, so it's $120,000 in taxes going back to 2014, which 
So that's six years. So that's six years. That's uh, seven hundred twenty thousand nine nine hundred seventy-eight. So where's the additional two hundred thousand? The retroactive period. The project closed in November twenty fourteen. From November twenty fourteen to July twenty seventeen, or June thirtieth, twenty seventeen, the taxes owing were nominal. It and wasn't they're until they're not owing; they were paid and, and paid. They were paid two, it, about two thousand dollars a right. year. It per, wasn't a, per sorry, Rabbi. And they were paid. So I'm, I'm just trying to so. I'm trying to get a sense of, so there's this Article 11, and the value on it is about a million dollars. What is the time period that we're giving to the developer that million dollars? What is that for? I, the million dollars is to take into account, uh, and it's conservative, the amount of time it's going to take for SEBCO to sell the last of the 36 units. So. So it's um, from what date to it, what date? It, the commencement date is the uh, the closing date, November 2014. And, and I, I think the termination, termination date, as written into the documents, is the date that the last unit is not owned by, uh, by the HDFC. That's how it's... Wh which the HD... Wh wh which you believe is going to be sometime this year. God willing. God, God, God willing, so 2018. So we are, we are looking for... So I guess what I'm trying to wash is, in your testimony, you're saying that the annual tax liability is 60000 uh, the, the Article 11 will, pro will extend. Let's think about it this way. The project hasn't started marketing. Uh, it's going to take it. Uh, Rabbi, it's going to take, I would think, um, a year to sell these units. Is that a cons I mean, the clock hasn't started ticking I, I'm yet. I'm just trying to wash your testimony that said there's $120,000 a year in tax liability and your estimate that it's going to cost a million dollars because what, whether it's five, five, five times 120, so if we said it was a five-year period to 2019, uh, that, that's still only uh, six, $600,000. I think we are anticipating that the finance department may um, index land improvement of uh, building value on some of the other buildings as we move over time. So while Sebco's, their HDSC, still owns the property, the land, some of the other buildings, not the first two buildings, but the third or the fourth or the fifth, they may be reassessed with, with a high, at a higher level of taxation. And that's, I think, the Article 11 tax exemption uh, projected value took into account that that occurrence, that possibility. And the Article 11 is going to be for two or all nine buildings? It's, it's for all nine buildings, for all okay. 30, yes. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, so just going through the uh, financing, so we have the tax, Article 11, we have the Article 16. Uh, did HPD provide any per unit subsidy or any mortgage subsidy or any other type of subsidy? No. Did HDC provide any loans or subsidy? No. The AHC is the only one, and they gave that, that subsidy was given directly to the end user, to the, to the purchaser. So how much is the New York State Affordable Housing Corporation grant? It's 1.26 or something. I it's have, it's um, I believe I have 1.6. Mm -hmm. You have 1.26. Maybe 1.26. 1.26. Okay. 1.26 1. 1. 1. is correct. Okay. And so that is th throughout the entire project? Yes. That's for all 36 units. That's correct. All 36. So that comes out to about $35,000 per unit? Well, it's, there's, there are 80% AMI and there are 110% AMI. The 80% are getting the, uh, the larger, the larger um, subsidy and the 110 AMI are getting the $25,000 subsidy. So the total is the 1.26, but it's, there are 16 units that are available to 80% AMI and 20 that are available to 110. Uh, do you recall what the higher uh, sub the, what the subsidy is for the higher units? I think it's thirty two five. Is that what? Yeah, for you, for units that are from ninety plus to one ten, mm -hmm. it's thirty two thousand five hundred dollars per DU. And That's, for the that lower, is correct. And for the lower AMI, 
It is $40,000 per DU, and these are single condominium units. Okay. Uh, is there any city capital on this? Only the land value. The okay. Uh, any private funds? Well, uh, no. I mean, there, there have been some injections that were put in to, in order to structure the financing, mm -hmm. but it'll all be paid from the proceeds. Uh, developer equity? Again, that we, the developer put, we, we put a million dollars in, mm -hmm. which we hope to take out from proceeds to take it to the next affordable housing project. Good. Uh, the folks who are doing the construction on these projects, mm -hmm. that they have health insurance and disability, if God forbid anything happens, will they be able to retire? Well, I can only tell you that I hired a general contractor who in turn hired subcontractors. So I'm really not privy to real information as to what they were paid and how they were paid. Uh, but we complied with whatever you to comply with for our closing requirements. Would you, would you agree at least for moving forward whether or not the people who are working for the people who work for the people who work for you should have access to, should have health insurance and disability and the ability to retire? I believe that that's a requirement in today's approvals. Uh, it wasn't at the time that we closed on the project, but I believe that that has become uh, somewhat of a requirement and we would comply with whatever needed to be complied with. HPD, is it now a requirement for there to be health insurance and disability for construction workers on these projects? There are many different kinds of requirements for many different kinds of projects. Does every single HPD project have a health disability and pension requirement for our I, I don't know off the top of my head, I'm sorry. It's you know okay. I'm new here. <laughs> yeah. I'll get you that information. I, I believe the answer is, is, <laughs> is no. So I think just if we could work together to make sure, and I think a similar question which I asked the, the previous developer mm -hmm. was just will the folks who did the work on your project be able to afford your affordable housing? That would really depend on their assets. That would depend on their family size. It would depend on so many different components that it's impossible to answer it. Uh, the, I, I would imagine that if some of them had um, had somewhat of a down payment available and had uh, at least a family of four, uh, they could possibly afford these units, yes. They so, it, so, so these, let, let's just say that they're at 80% of AMI, so you, you believe somebody working on this project would be making $83,450 a year? I can't speak for the general contractor. I don't know. Would, would you agree that moving forward, it might be important to make sure that the folks who are building things can, can live in what they're building? In theory, yes. But it, in order to uh, af affect the stock of affordable housing in the, in the city of New York, uh, you'd have to see if you can make it viable or financially yeah. viable. In theory, I des definitely agree with you. I, I, I'm interested in, 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 in working with you and, and some of the other developers that I've had the occasion to come before me where we share similar values to see because uh, it, it strikes me that you did not get $600,000 in subsidies per unit on this project. What do you mean? I don't know if I understand. That there may be more money on the table to make these projects not only work, but work for lower income New Yorkers and ensure that the people That's who for are this doing particular the work can afford it. For this, pr for this program through the yeah. city of New York, there was, there was no other funds available. Yes. It's all probably borrowed money from a bank. I, so, no, I, I but got going it. forward, if we would be able to, to, build, to build equity, uh, whether the city would in, uh, put in a grant or something, I would, I would certainly be willing to, to guarantee uh, whatever I have to guarantee you know, as long as the project worked. We're, we're a nonprofit. There's no profit here. There's nobody making money. I, I, I understand, uh, I, I also ask everyone who comes before it about MWB and local hire. Okay, local hire I don't know because the general contractor again hired the, um, the, the subcontractors. Mm -hmm. MWB we did have from the state, the state had an MWBE requirement which we have far surpassed. We had a 5% requirement. I think for the MBE we're already um, cl closer to 10. Uh, and, and, and for the WBE, uh, we had a, uh, the requirement, I think, was for $60,000. We've already paid uh, over 80. Uh, I think those are my uh, questions. Thank you.
Do we have any members of the public here on land use item 104? Uh, seeing none, I will close this public hearing. We have many, many more today. As we return to the regularly scheduled order, uh, we will be ho holding uh, a hearing on land use item 102, the Burien Gardens application for property located at 1479 to 1497 St. Mark's Avenue in Council Member Amprey Samuels District in Brooklyn. HPD seeks approval for a new 40 year tax exemption pursuant to Article 11 of the Private Housing and Finance Law. These existing buildings contain 77 dwelling units for low income seniors eligible for Section 8 vouchers, and there is a project rental assistance contract in place. The project currently has outstanding tax liens, and the owner has entered into a payment plan. The new Article 11 tax exemption will facilitate the resolution of the liens for the which the HUD will pay the interest and approval of this application will also establish a new regulatory agreement ensuring affordability until 2058. I would like to now open the public hearing on land use item 102. Uh, if uh, the applicants could state your names for the record and the uh, committee council will swear you in. Please state your names. Hi, my name is Nick Simmons. I work for Mutual Housing Association of New York and I'm the landlord ambassador for this project. Lacey Talbert, HPD. Carolyn Williams, HPD. Do you each swear? Time. Carolyn uh, Williams, HPD. Thank you. Do you each swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give? Oh, one more. Okay, sorry. One more. Peggy Waddell, Berean Gardens. Do you each swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you will answer all questions truthfully? Yes. 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 Okay. Let me begin your testimony. Land use number 102 consists of an exemption area containing one occupied multiple dwelling located at 1481 St. Mark's Avenue, block 1452, lot 66 and 70 to 78 in Brooklyn Council District 41, known as Berean Gardens HGFC. The Berean Gardens project is a section eight development approved for disposition by the city council on August 3rd, 1993 for low income seniors. The project comprises 77 units of senior housing, of which two apartments are vacant. Additionally, there are two community facility spaces used by the tenants for recreational activities. The building contains a mixture of unit types, including 19 studios and 58 one-bedroom apartments, including a superintendent's unit. HUD requires the project serve senior citizens with household incomes that do not exceed 50% of AMI, which is approximately $41,750 for a two-person household according to the 2018 income limits. Tenants pay no more than 30% of their income toward rent. This transaction does not include any construction. In 1993, in designating the project as a UDAP area, the council also approved the merger of the municipal lots uh, comprising the project, block 1452, lot 66, and lots 70 to 78, but the lot merger was not completed. Additionally, the 1993 approval provided the project with a partial tax exemption of uh, $28,909 plus 25% increases for a period of 40 years. The proposed action is requesting a new Article 11 providing the project with a full tax exemption for the first three years and a 7% flat gross rent tax for the remaining 37 years. Currently, there are outstanding property tax liens and the sponsor has entered into payment agreements with all lien holders. While a lot merger is proposed to occur, it cannot happen until the project is clear of all liens. In order to help preserve long-term affordability of the low-income senior rental units, HPD is before the planning subcommittee seeking approval for Article 11 tax benefits that will help maintain affordability of the residential units, the value of which is $7,709,136. Um, net present value being $2,425,779 which is $31,504 per DU. The tax exemption will coincide with a regulatory agreement for a term of 40 years. In addition, the owner will be required to maintain its HAP contract for the remainder of the term. How and why did this affordable housing uh, senior housing development accrue property taxes and fall behind in paying them? 
Well, at first, when we first, oh, and they first applied for Article 11 with this committee, um, and it was approved, uh, there was only receiving taxes on one lot, and that was lot 66. Um, and so all the taxes were being, for 10 lots were being billed to one lot. Um, in the year 2013, when um, the taxes were started getting dispersed across 10 lots, the majority of these lots do not even have a building. Uh, some of them are vacant, uh, like parking lots or community facility space, so they were not receiving these bills. Um, when time came, when they started realizing how much arrears, um, they figured out that um, there, there was four liens on the property that were um, in jeopardy of being sold to two different <coughs> lien servicers, and that's when um, myself as landlord ambassador, we were pulled in with the HPD to figure out what was the dilemma at first, we thought it was um, uh, false. Uh, the taxes were too high since um, the taxes just dispersed across uh, from year 12, uh, 2012, 2013. And we thought that they were wrongfully charged. After debating this with HPD and Department of Finance for some time, a few months, we realized that they were not wrongfully charged, but they were just spread out across all 10 lots. And so, in order to, we, we realized that we couldn't do a retroactive, what we initially wanted to do when we first heard about this case. Um, so what we ended up doing was we started, um, you know, going back through the paperwork and figuring out when this problem started and trying to figure out how to get out, uh, get into payment plans with the lien servicers and Department of Finance because they were in jeopardy of foreclosure with four of the liens that were sold to the lien servicers from the last lien sale. Is the property being transferred to Mutual Housing Assist Association of New York from uh, Berrien HDFC or? No. no. We are, um, uh, it's a new program with HPD where um, a couple community organizations, non for profits like ourselves, who have affordable housing and went through certain, uh, not really exact circumstances, uh, but have experienced in circumstances throughout the years. So we were uh, given this opportunity by HPD to help out small homeowners, not-for-profits who fall into hardships with the, with taxes, uh, physical um, distress, financial distress, and you know work with them with the action plan and try to figure out the best route to get um, from behind all those arrears that accumulated over time. Councilman, so, the, the yeah. Manny is a consultant only. They have no ownership in the project and will not have any ownership in the project. They are strictly a consultant. And so they and so they are being compensated by Enterprise or by HPD or Enterprise has a program which they fund. But they got a grant and they fund the um, activities of Manny on behalf of the owner. Who is Enterprise? Enterprise Community Partners is a national nonprofit that works in the affordable housing field. Okay, so do we have somebody from Berrien HDSC here? Yes. Great. Yes. Okay, let's get everyone at the table together if possible. Great. I, I just wanna thank uh, Mutual Housing Association of New York, Manny, for being at this table. I'm a huge fan of your organization and of your uh, executive director, Ismini. She is absolutely amazing. Uh, and and she, she's gotten tough questions too. And uh, she, she is one of the only people who's ever coming back after the tough questions to uh, uh, suggest that perhaps my questions weren't tough enough. <laughs> uh, so I wanna just uh, thank you for that. So. This is a uh, rehabilitation, and so I guess another question is, uh, the project's property is split among numerous zoning and property lots. Why were the lots never merged? Is a merger necessary to grant the Article 11 and address the outstanding tax issues? The lot merger cannot be effectuated until the tax liens are basically gone and the taxes are current on the tax lots. Okay. How much are the tax liens on this property? They're currently approximately 762,000 total. And uh, Uh, 
I was just looking to see if that was on in your testimony. So you have seven hundred sixty-two thousand dollars in tax liens, and uh, so the city said the taxes are due. They didn't get paid, uh, and I guess while we have Barry Ann here, can you share what, why they weren't paid? Um, we took over management in, uh, two years ago, and we found that, I mean, documents were all over the place, but it appeared that um, only one lot was receiving, what was being charged, and it looked like the previous management company was paying that particular lot, which was 66. And then I could find in the records where uh, they begun to get, they, to, uh, get uh, charges for the other lots. Um, nine other lots because there are 10 in total. Um, so I could see where they tried to pay, but it was just too, too much because each lot now was being charged and they had gone into installment payments, but they weren't able to keep them up because it is low income and the, the rents weren't enough to sustain it and maintain the property. So uh, it just got to a point where um, I guess they just gave up, I don't know. <laughs> Okay. So we, when we took over, we um, tried to straighten things out, and um, it, it, it's, it, it's a monumental task that we took on. And then um, I think uh, Council Member Neely had a session or, you know, counseling session that I attended, and that's how I was informed about uh, Mahaney and reached out to them and everybody else that I could reach out to to get help to, um, to figure it out. Christine Shahat from HUD, everybody has been really working with us very hard to do this. You just mentioned one of my favorite uh, council members. I'll make sure to reach out and let her know that the project that got started with her is. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, sorry. Uh, so we met with Darlene Mealy. So the 762000 so the city put liens on it. You reached out, and so the city can just forgive those liens, and, and we don't need to pay it back, right? Oh no, no, sir. The way it works is that the DOF is the enter the agency responsible. HPD does not have the authority to waive tax liens. We can make recommendations to OMB for them not to be sold, but we do not have the authority as an agency to say whether or not a tax lien is waived or not. So, okay, so the city sold those tax liens for $762,000 and we got dollar for dollar full cash value and now we can use that to pay for affordable housing, right? Is that how it works? Nope. So the general budget, that's a, that's a more of an OMB question, I'm sorry. Fair how, enough. The, how the money is funneled back through agencies and through OMB is so. So that that was a little bit of if sarcasm. Please correct me if I'm wrong, but these tax liens are sold at pennies on the dollar. My understanding is is that they're sold. I'm not certain how. Okay. My belief. Unfortunately, that's not a function of HPD how they're sold. It looks like Manny I, may have I, an answer. I, from my experience, how I believe it works is that um, if you accumulate too much arrears, whether it's with taxes, water, and sewage, over time, um, if you don't make any attempt to get in a payment plan and to uh, come up with those arrears, whether pay in full, come up with a payment plan, put a down payment, um, then you receive the 90 day, 60 day, 30 day, 10 day notice for the upcoming lien sale. Um, of course, though, you do need to have a accumulated um, arrear of those taxes you're not going to put a lien sale for two thousand uh, dollars for your taxes when your property's worth like over a couple million. Um, it usually tends to be when you start getting uh, kind of like a ballpark figure around like twenty thousand, ten thousand. From my experience, is when they start getting sold through the lien servicers. And, but the lien servicers aren't paying full cash value. They're they're buying them at auction for less than their value. I I don't have the answer for that, but um, the the amount of interest rate that are on the that the lien servicers have on a daily rate, I would assume that they buy for cheaper so they can make some sort of, uh, you know, make some I, sort I of I think sales. your assumption and, and uh, my belief are, are the same and saying that no one's corrected me. So I guess the next question is, has, has, anyone, has anyone at HPD reached out to OMB or Department of Finance to say, 
what are you doing? You're selling liens on affordable housing, and now we have to go pay somebody tax dollars for something. So, so we were owed $762,000 that we shouldn't have really gotten paid for anyway. We sold it for less, but now we're going to have to go pay somebody? Why, why can't we just refund them the money that they paid in error and cancel the transaction? Well, we spoke to the Department of Finance, and there's a couple situations in which you know liens can be forgiven, and unfortunately, this is not those situations. One is if the liens were given in error, which, as they stated, they were not. The second is if there is a nonprofit organization, they have a process they can go through. To, if, they're, if they were given liens in error, HDFCs are not considered nonprofits um, in that same way. So, so I, I, I would just say that if we have another one of these, I'd like Department of Finance and OMB to be at this table. Uh, I, I have been fighting these lien sales along with council member Antonio Reynoso, who had a very amazing legislative director who is also fighting on this issue. And I think it's ridiculous that we're putting liens on churches for an $8,000 water bill, which happened in my district, and uh, affordable housing so that we're in a situation where we now have to give up additional money from tax dollars to uh, pay people back for them giving us minor money on the dollar and we're, the city's losing money on this deal. Uh, so that being said, just going into the rest of the project, uh, what was the land value when this was transferred over? Um, it was done in 1993. Hold on one second. The next question is going the, In 1994, um, the project was conveyed by the City of New York to the Birmingham Missionary Housing Development Fund Company for $38,500. So that was the price or that was the value? That was the price, $38,500 in 1994. Okay, what was the value? Do we know? I'm not certain of the value in 1994. Okay. Uh, and then we're looking to do a partial tax abatement for a term of 40 years, and uh, you already testified on that value, uh, so I appreciate that. And the subsidy that you're doing this under is the Landlord Ambassador Program, and uh, what is, are there any uh, HPD subsidies? Uh, actually, this is the HUD Multifamily Program. Landlord Ambassador Program is a different thing. The landlord ambassador is a consultant that works with the owner to help okay. them get through their challenge. The program is the HUB multifamily program, but there are no additional capital dollars being provided. Uh, how many class A, B, and C violations are there on the property? Um, right now there are three class A, 15 class B, and two class C. Any ECB violations? Uh, two, either DOB or ECB, DOB, ECB. And what will be the cost of fixing all of those violations? Um, that's actually something that they're working on, if you mm -hmm. want to talk a little bit well, about Peggy, what you you're wanna looking at doing. So it's not part of this application, but they are looking at renovation as a next step. Yeah, so um, I think Peggy, you talked about it. Is, is the purpose of why you're here today just to wipe out the outstanding <coughs> tax liens, or is it to deal with the violations or both? N neither. The tax liens are not being wiped out. The tax liens are being paid back. Yes. The As a part of the closing, the owner is required to show dismissal requests and resolution of every violation just listed as part of the closing process. But if you don't know how much money they need for the rehabilitation, then... Why are we here today? There's no rehabilitation to this project. This is simply a financial transaction to alleviate the tax burden on the project. Okay. There's no construction. So what what are the type of A violations that we're looking at here, and how much are, uh, are they easy to fix? Are we talking about a, a uh, broken light bulb here, or are we talking about
We don't have specific information on the exact violation, but we just know the number of violations. So I, th I think Manny had some had some ideas. Um, uh, on the violations, um, and I don't have the, a document with me, but most of them have been cleared up over the last uh, month or so. Um, I don't know when this lady stayed in. Uh, That's required as per the clothing that the owner address each one. Right. And then I have a project needs assessment that we've just recently done. We, we had done, I'm sorry. And um, it's going to run about a about million dollars. <laughs> Is the uh, Article 11 going to be sufficient to cover, to, to allow you to repay the 762000 in liens that the city could have just forgiven instead of making it get paid and then also do this million dollars in work? So let me speak to that, please. So what the, what the HPD is planning to do is we're requesting zero taxes for three years, so that during the period in which they pay back the liens, there are no additional taxes assessed. And then from year four to year, year four through the end of the tax exemption, the owner will pay 7% of their gross rent as a tax going forward from year four through year 40. Okay. Uh, so there was a HUD multifamily <laughs> program on do we remember? Do we know what the value of the HUD multifamily program was? That's just the program. That's not like the name of a subsidy. Okay. Was there a sub? What was, it? was there a HUD subsidy? The HUD, the HUD provided the subsidy in 1994 to build the building, mm -hmm. and there is an operating subsidy that provides the rent for the building to operate. And how much is that operating subsidy? It's not a subsidy. The building is uh, it's operated on the rents, the incomes. Mm -hmm. That's what uh, the operating budget is based on. And then there's, and we also have to contribute to a operating reserve account. Sure. So how much do you get from HUD each year? Um, so it's it's a Section Eight it's program. Section eight. Yeah. So that's what subsidizes the rents because it's the low income seniors. So basically, they can qualify if they make up to 50% AMI, and the difference between 30% of their income and 50% of AMI is subsidized through the Section 8 program. Is there a New York State subsidy on the project? No. Any city capital, any private funds, any developer equity? No. Was there an increase in FAR in the original project? Way back when? Okay. In terms of the million dollars in work, do you know if the folks who are doing the work will receive health insurance or disability or pension? We're not at that point yet, but they will. We have two employees of the maintenance workers, their union, it's a union building, uh, that's under 32BJ. And we have one employee uh, that we pay full uh, medical for all of the employees of uh, my company, that we pay 100% medical. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, and so that's that's the service workers. Are the 32 BJ workers going to be able to do the main, the million dollars or so in maintenance, or who are the folks who do that maintenance work going to also have health insurance and disability and pension benefits? Uh, we'll, we'll build, the maintenance workers won't be doing the work. Uh, we'll have to contract that out, and then having sat through uh, two previous interrogations, <laughs> I will probably try to enter into a contract with the uh, contractors to make sure that. Everybody's covered. We, they will all be able to afford living in there, so. <laughs> I appreciate it, <laughs> and uh, if I, I appreciate the commitment. If you run into any trouble, please let Ismini know, and we will come to the table, and I will personally uh, work with, with you and uh, Amphrey Samuels to make sure that we can find somebody who can do the work at a rate that can be afforded. Um, and if not, we may come back to the table to see if HPD can be a little bit more generous with the Article 11 terms. Uh, so to the extent we can get those numbers sooner, uh, we, we just came from one of the most generous subsidies programs I've seen at $600,000 per unit, which will continue to be my high watermark. And uh, we will, uh, at, at $31,000 per dwelling unit, you are, uh, you are 20 times less expensive than other affordable housing. 
Uh, and then similarly for uh, the folks that you'll contract out, will you consider working with subcontractor contractors or subcontractors that are MWBEs? Absolutely. And would you consider bringing in local hires for either service workers or doing the uh, construction work? We're committed to that. I think those are, oh, so the hot, when does the HAP contract expire? The, the, the HAP contract is an annual contract, so every year the owner applies to HUD for the rent for the next year. When, when does the HUD program expire? The, um, there is, the HAP contract is generally, uh, the use but restrictions on the property are for a minimum of 40 years. Right. And that's so 40 years. So from 1994 to 2034. But usually with a PRAC, they are senior in perpetuity, which means that it will remain a senior project in perpetuity. So I guess one question is, if we do nothing today, it is 2018, we could walk away for 16 years and it would stay affordable under the HUD program for 40 years, for, for until 2034. There's one caveat. If this project were to be subject to foreclosure the way it was in danger of, because of the way the HUD regulations are stipulated, the project will be free from all of its restrictions. That was the, uh, the dire circumstances that we were trying to avoid. So somebody can buy $762,000 in debt for pennies on the dollar, use that to force it into foreclosure, buy it at foreclosure, and then force all of the affordable housing tenants out? Worst case scenario, yes. Okay. And, and so without this additional Article 11 layered over the HUD, um, you can't fix, you would not be able to pay back that $762,000. That is correct. And so I guess the other question is, so we have $762,000 that needs to be repaid, and then we have about a million dollars in work, but the net present value of the Article 11 benefit that you testified to is $2.425 million. So why aren't we just doing $1,762,000 in subsidies instead of uh, 2.4, and it's actually $7.7 .7 million over the course of the Article 11? Why? I would like to just say that, um, so these things happen in stages. One thing doesn't happen all at one time. So the physical needs assessment was a requirement from HUD to ascertain the future needs of the project and to help them figure out going forward how much money HUD would need to set aside on an annual basis to pay for the repairs that are in this P&A that she just discussed. So the $1 million would not happen all at one time. It would happen slowly over time. What typically happens is through years one through five, the immediate needs are addressed right away. So whatever the cost is from year one through five. And then from years five through 10, the next set of work begins. So this is not something that happens all at once. It usually happens over time as the money from HUD becomes available. But we're giving $7.7 million, $7 million over the next 40 years. So does this location need $7.7 .7 million? Sorry, let's discount the 762. So does this site need $7 million in new work? Site needs a lot of work um, because, because all of the money that uh, it, it seemed that the previous management company was getting was going to try to pay the, the taxes. So the building just went, it needs everything. Roof, water tank, it needs uh, structural repairs. It just needs a lot. So, uh, and as, um, as William said, it's, you, you can't do it overnight, so it's going to be stretched out over a period of time. So I, I, I'm incredibly supportive of the project. I guess I'm just concerned that we're writing a check for $7.7 .7 .7 million today, mm -hmm. but we don't actually know how much money you need, and we're doing a partial tax abatement, so we could be giving you more money. 
a roof is expensive. We know that from NYCHA. We, it, boilers are expensive. So we're either being, we're either get being too generous or not generous enough, but we don't know, do we? One of the ways that we mitigate against that is that if there are any savings in the building, HUD will require the owner to put those monies in a reserve for, those, for that work. So for instance, if the taxes that they were supposed to pay in one year, just for example, were $1,000, but they, um, but we, because of our tax exemption, they pay fifty dollars. That fifty dollars will go into a reserve for the project to build up cash, to pay for those reserves on its own. I mean, the work rather on its own. If, if we if we didn't vote on this today, but we gave you time to go figure out how much the value, uh, how much work needed to be done. And, and we voted on it in, uh, on June 7th. Uh, is that a enough time, sorry, not June 7th, but after June 7th, would that be enough time to close? Is it enough time to find out what the real cost of the improvements are? Could we do it in July? What, what is stopping us from getting the information that we need before we vote on it? I mean, I think it, uh, as Carolyn is saying, it's a complicated process. It takes more time than that. You know, they just finished the needs assessment. And I think, f you know, the, the point of this is really to address the lien issue first, um, also to address the tax lot issue that can then be addressed once the liens are taken care of. Um, and then that's going to get them, you know, in good footing to even consider the next phase of the project, which is going to be you know, the some scope phase. of repairs that we're discussing today. Um, could, could, we, could we approve the partial exemption for the first three years? Sorry, the full exemption for the first three years and then have you come back? The, the way that HPD typically operates is that we approach council at the onset for the long term so that we don't have to approach again because we feel that all the analysis that we do in the background is supportive of the, of the proposal that we put before you. And I also think so we just don't want to take a chance in waiting on this. You know, I think the, the more the liens are not addressed, the more chance they have of, you know, predatory equity and things like that. And, you know, we don't want to see any of these seniors lose their homes. Uh, um, so how long would it take to find out how much it will cost to actually do the improvements that are needed? I mean, we would have to, we can't answer that right now. It, it depends on the scope. We'd have to talk to our development teams. You know, we really, there's a lot that goes into that work. And this also has to be HUD approved as well. So that sounds like months, not days or weeks. Yes, correct. So why isn't it more appropriate to come back once that work is done? Because the tax lanes are still um, the tax liens are still generating interest and they have to be paid off. Isn't there a court order? Yeah. Interest rate, yeah. Yeah, Carolyn, you're aware. Yeah. Um, the court order is this month. Oh, yeah, just say you don't have anything. Right. Did it say that you have a plan? About, the, I'm sorry, but I, I was. About the court orders and the payment plan? Yeah, so I, I, was, I was trying to explain that. So I th um, why there's a, the underlying issue, why it's a partial, uh, full for first three years, partial three years, four through 40 is because we're, they're not only into for payment plan with the lien servicers. I also be also assisted um, Peggy and the owners in getting to six additional payment plans with the Department of Finance. Those also accumulate interest on a daily basis. The lien servicers accumulate. So, I mean, so that's why year one through three is getting, we are um, requesting a full exemption because that's the biggest portion that they're going to be paid. And then from year four through 10, that's when they're going to be paying off the arrears with the remaining six lots that they also got into payment plans with. So that's, um, that gives like why they're that's requesting that type of. So contract. that was not included in the testimony. How much wasn't sold at tax liens? What is the outstanding tax liability for uh, Department of Finance? And why aren't we just forgiving that retroactively instead of we, giving we, a tax abatement so that you can pay those liens with, sorry, pay DOF backs taxes with interest. 
Um, well, because once again, it was it was charged correctly. It was just dispersed across m plenty we, of lots. But we can do a retroactive tax abatement. And, and that's what we try. And that's what we were trying to pursue for the you know when I first jumped on and heard about this case and started working with Peggy and the owners. But it was they they weren't able to uh, we weren't able to take that action plan that path. The only plan we were able to do was become current on what we were rightfully charged but wrongfully addressed to. What is the DOF tax liability on this project? So um, we got into six payment plans uh, for six of the other <laughs> 10 lots. Um, the payment plans are, well, two lots we paid in full, lots 73 and 74. That was $27,489.62 for lot 73. Lot 74 was also paid in full, and that was $24,994.12. For lot 71, we entered into a 10-year payment plan. We had to um, put a down payment. Uh, well, they, they currently paid 4888 and they have quarterly payments of $653 for 10 years, so that'd be 40 payments. And these are all the Department of Finance payment plans are on a quarterly basis. The next one is lot 76. It's also in a 10-year payment plan. Uh, we already paid 5059 and it's $675.99 on, on a quarterly basis for 10 years, 40 payments. Uh, How much was that one? Uh, the quarterly payments are $675.99 for 40 payments and we already paid 5059. Not me, I'm sorry, I keep including Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> Um, yeah. So then lot 78, um, they, since they never defaulted on a payment plan, we didn't have to put a down payment down. Um, I would preferably like to, but the problem what, is- What's the total value of the outstanding DOF liabilities? Because so far- It's we're, a lot, I'm, I'm, yeah, not, I'm only two down. No, I got it. But so far you're, you're saying things that are in tens of thousands and payments that are three figures and in hundreds of dollars. And that still doesn't come out to either the $2.4 million net present or the 7.7 right. uh, so full value. So I'm just. I can answer that. Um, so they currently, just to sum it up, they currently paid $62,430. The down payments were $60,000 and $252. So that's already $120,000 and uh -huh. $122,000. Oh, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I have the exact numbers right okay. here. I'm sorry. So for Department of Finance, total liens of 415,000 at 18% interest for 10 years. The two other lien holders, one has <coughs> Tower Capital, has liens of 157,285 at 18% interest for three years. And MTAG is another servicer that has total liens of 190,000 at 18% interest for three years. And is that the 760,000? Two or is yes. Is there any? Okay. So, I guess for HPD, why can't we the Article Eleven forgive the DOF portion for four hundred and fifteen thousand? My understanding is because of the length of the time that has gone by and the fact that there were court actions going on that we were unable to, we were unable to. Um, excuse me. We weren't able to uh, to pull the liens back. Okay, but if we do a retroactive Article 11, which we've done multiple times today and we'll be voting on multiple times today, regardless of whether or not the lien is valid, doesn't that blow away the tax liability? Well, HUD has agreed to repay the tax liability because it was due. The, it was no. So if HUD is paying it, why do we have to? do pay it out of the article? Why, why do we have to do the Article 11 so that uh, Berrien Gardens can do it? HUD is, HUD is, um, HUD is helping in the form of a uh, rent increase um, to give us additional revenue to pay off um, the liens as well as to try and maintain the building. So we still have to pay them. We have in the, it's a two year, two, Three, three years for the two that the four uh, lots that were sold, uh, so we have to make the, that. Um, that's that was the court. I didn't realize that's what you're talking about. That was the court order uh, that we have, and so we can't renege on that. And then of course we have to pay uh, the installment uh, for the Department of Finance 
So we're doing that, and everything is done through rents and, and, and the HUD subsidy. Um, so I, oh. we just need the time. Um, no, I, I get it. I'm just, I'm almost tempted to step out and call the Commissioner of Tax and Finance right now and just ask him, well, HPD should be able to answer why are we able to do an Article 11 retroactively for this taxes This property has owed. court orders that they have to pay. The property was almost in foreclosure. We pulled it okay, back from so, foreclosure. So there's a court order that says the city of New York may not offer an Article 11 to forgive retroactive tax. No, it's a court order that they have to pay the taxes that were due. Not that we can't provide an Article 11, if but that they have a, to pay if the we did taxes. An Article 11 that was retroactive, would the court still, it, it, if they are ordered to pay the taxes are due and we say there's now an Article 11 that is retroactive, we're doing one moving forward, but we're doing it retroactive, that the, they wouldn't have to pay it anymore. I don't understand that. You, if, if you do it retroactive and monies have already, uh, the city has already gotten the money from the- uh, Have you already I, paid the 400, so you've already paid a bulk of it? No, we paid the down payment. I think it was like 15, uh, so a percent down, and we've been making the monthly payments. I think this is like maybe the third month. So we're giving, we are taking our income. So our income comes from real estate taxes. So that, so we're we're saying to you, you don't have to pay us taxes, so that you can take the additional money that you have to pay us again through the Department of Finance to pay your back taxes, and then you're giving them 18% interest using tax, the, for using the excess money you will have from not having to pay taxes. Does that, does that sound strange to anyone other than me? Sir, unfortunately, we can't usurp the, um, the court orders that require them to be paid. So that's the challenge that we have, that we have no choice but to make sure that the property does not go in foreclosure. We pulled the property back from foreclosure by, the owner pulled the properties back from foreclosure by agreeing to the payments that were due over years. These were not just one year of taxes. I don't remember how far back the taxes went, but it's over multiple, multiple years that the taxes were, were not paid. So unfortunately, because they were, the liens were so far gone and they were in court about to be foreclosed upon, we at HPD do not have the authority to usurp has, a court order. Has H, I, as triangulated as it is, sir, I understand your frustration, but we don't have the ability to usurp a court order. Again, I just want to stress that, you know, this is, I think Carolyn said it the other day when we were talking about this, that, you know, this is triage. <laughs> we're doing what we can to save this property from foreclosure. Um, has, has the, this is the tool that we have to do it. Has HPD ever issued a retroactive Article 11 on a lien? On Before, a but the, just remember that the liens were not sold. And when, when, when HPD has the authority to do a retroactive to Article 11, the liens are not already sold and in servicing and in a default. These liens were also sold, they were in servicing, and they were in default by time HPD became involved. But only 340,000 have been sold to Tower and MTAG. DOF still has the majority at 415,000. Again, we don't have the authority to usurp a court order. Do you have a copy of the court order? Oh, I didn't have that. I, I have never seen a court order that says that, I've never seen a court order that can't be modified. I have never seen a court order where if two parties to the court order have a settlement agreement that uh, those parties can't do that. Never in my life. And uh, I, I have never seen a judge who allows, who, who would say to somebody, I'm sorry, you, you can't satisfy the, the judgment through another means. And I think that if the judge in this matter saw that the city through HPD is giving a tax abatement so that you have income so that you can then pay 18% interest on money that you owe to the Department of Finance at the same time as you're not going to be paying taxes moving forward. They would say, um, to, to quote Emma Wolf, we have a right hand, left hand problem here. Uh, and it's, it's. 
Sir, I agree, but at the same time, in order for us to get this property on good financial standing, these are the elements okay. of the transaction and that- Do you have another item before us today? Yes, we do. Okay, so what we'll do is um, we'll hear the next item. We will, we still have, I think, two, your, your Hudson Pierce. Yes. So, and 501 West 51st Street is not you or it's you? No, it's not. During 501 51st, which we will put last, uh, if you can get on the phone with HPD, if you can get on the phone with DOF, if I need to recess and call the commissioner, my, the, the finance commissioner myself, I feel that first I want to support Virian however I can. It's just that it seems like HPD and Department of Finance are not communicating. If I need to call the judges chambers, I can, but like there needs to be an adult in the room trying to Again, make sure I that. Again, I talked to the Department of Finance this week about yeah. this project. I yeah. asked them to explain the questions that you asked us about why the liens cannot be forgiven. Um, again, there, <coughs> excuse me, are two ways that they are empowered to do that. It is if the liens are, are given an error or if there is a nonprofit who shouldn't have gotten the liens in the first but place that can a, go but, through a whole but process. But HPD can forgive. This does not apply in either one of those cases. Right, but article, but HPD can grant Article 11s with council approval. Okay, so and I will. Recess or can I so we'll, we will recess this and we will go on to the next item. Uh, and so the next item can first. I, can I request yeah. a three minute break? Yes, sure. Because <laughs> oh, I really don't understand uh, with the court order. You know, you go, how do we get back in court to uh, reverse that? I mean, if. If this is the judgment, how does how do you do that? I mean, what what authority? Oh no worries. Uh, so, uh, a lot of times you can just agree to a settlement uh, between parties. Uh, you don't generally have to go back to court. The court order is about a party using it for enforcement purposes. If you are uncomfortable, you can go back to the court to ask for it to be so ordered. Uh, but in this case, the city would just be. I, so it's not that simple, sir. I tell it, and then in the meantime, we still have two. Which cases. Supreme Court judges this in front of? Oh, I, um, look, Andrea, um, Brooklyn Legal Services represented. I, I'm pulling everybody that I could think of. No so worries. Brooklyn Legal Services. So we're, we're, we're going to recess. We'll, we'll, we'll work with you. I, I'm an attorney. You've got to work with me. You just have to. I got sent all these seniors that. Yes. Uh, I mean, it, this is a big You, you have an amazing, you have, you, you have had the luck of two amazing council members. Between all of us, we're gonna whether we move forward today or it's just for for each day. I just want folks to come knowing how much the work is gonna cost. If we have a weird situation where we're borrowing from Peter to pay Paul, uh, I just want to make sure we've engaged it. And if um, the commissioner of HPD and the commissioner of Department of Finance aren't able to work together on this, I need to bring in OMB and Melanie Hartsock to figure this out because the idea of not taking income so that we can pay ourselves back. It's just, it is it is ludicrous. So uh, let's recess. We'll do a, a five minute break and then we'll take on the next item which would be Hudson Pierce. Thank you.
series of conflicts that they're creating with the Hellions for the moment.
before the business day is over.
We are ready. Here are the testimonies. We are back from a uh, five-minute recess that lasted longer than five <laughs> minutes. Uh, I want to thank the uh, last uh, panel, and that public hearing has been uh, recessed, and uh, we are having conversations with the Department of Finance and HPD uh, to see if we can't get around what looked like a, a counterintuitive process of deferring the city's income from our tax base in order to pay ourselves back at 18%. So we hope to get that resolved. Uh, and uh, so the next item is uh, in Council Member Levine's district. Uh, I think this is his third or fourth item before this committee. Uh, he is uh, somebody who really engages and uh, generally has the best deals. Uh, Councilmember Levine, do you have any opening that you'd like to give before I read into the record? Thank you. Just very, very briefly, Mr. Chair, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about this proposed land use item 103. It's for uh, twin buildings, which are a block from my district office, so we know them well. It's on Amsterdam Avenue, 1626 and 1640. It's an 83-unit building. Um, we talk often about our desire to, to serve truly low-income New Yorkers in our affordable housing. And this is a building where that's actually happening. The average uh, income is 25% of AMI. Um, the maximum is capped at 50%. Um, so this is truly a building serving people who might have nowhere else to live. And um, this item would, in addition to extending affordability uh, from the perspective of the current residents, would have the benefit of bringing in an infusion of resources for upgrading uh, their apartments, including new kitchens, new baths. Um, there are a lot of ADA accessibility problems in the building, which, um, which I believe this would fix. Um, some modernized lighting as well. Uh, so this really would bring about a quality of life improvement um, for these 83 families, uh, in addition to uh, locking in affordability um, through, uh, I believe, another 40 years. Um, and, and why I'm pleased to support this project. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, land use item 103, Hudson Piers 2, for property in Council Member Levine's District, Manhattan. A new par partial Article 11 tax exemption is sought for two fully occupied buildings with 83 units at, located at 1626, 1640 Amsterdam Avenues. There's an existing Article 5 tax exemption which will be terminated and replaced with the Article 11. This will extend affordability as the Article 5 tax exemption expires in 2024. All units will remain income restricted at 50% of AMI with tenants paying 30% of their income as rent. Uh, I will now open the public hearing and ask the committee council to swear in this panel. Please state your names before um, you give the affirmation. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you will answer all council member questions truthfully? Carolyn Williams, yes. Lacey Tauber, yes. Mary Brooke, yes. You may begin. Land use item number 103 consists of an exemption area containing two fully occupied multiple dwellings located at 1626 and 1640 Amsterdam Avenue in Manhattan Council District 7 and is known as Hudson Piers 2. The project is a low-income Section 8 development currently owned by an Article 5 housing redevelopment company approved for disposition by the Board of Estimate on December 4th, 1980. At the time of disposition approval, the housing company also received a property tax exemption which is set to expire on March 31st, 2024. The two buildings that make up Hudson Piers 2 contain a mixture of unit types, including 48 one-bedroom, 29 two-bedroom, five three-bedrooms, and one superintendent's unit for a total of 83 units. There is an existing housing assistance program HAP contract with HUD, and under the contract, household incomes do not exceed 50% of AMI, and tenants pay no more than 30% of their income toward rent. 
Under HPD's HUD multifamily program, the current owner will convey the project to a new entity formed under a Housing Development Fund Corporation, HDFC, and the acquisition will utilize private financing. The HDFC will enter into a new HAP contract with HUD for an additional 20 years upon expiration of the current agreement when it reaches the end of its term, March 31, 2030. Eligible tenants will receive Section 8 rental assistance. A moderate rehabilitation is planned for the project that includes making the units ADA adaptable. Additional work will be upgrades to the kitchens and bathrooms, new LED lighting and code compliance switches um, and outlets, as well as replacing smoke detectors and plastering and painting. There are very few housing code violations and the rehab will address any that are outstanding. In order to facilitate redevelopment of the project, HPD is before the planning subcommittee seeking approval for the housing company to voluntarily dissolve their status as an Article 5, terminate their current tax exemption, and enter into a new Article 11 tax exemption for a term of 40 years, coinciding with the regulatory agreement. The net present value of the tax exemption is approximately $3,024,575. Cumulative value is approximately $8,646,149. I understand that the Section 8 contract, which runs through 2038, restricts all the units to 50% of AMI. Uh, the Article 11 runs to 2058. What will be the AMI restrictions in the regulatory agreement? The regulatory agreement. Oh, good afternoon. The regulatory agreement will match the HUD restrictions. There's currently a uh, Section 8 contract which runs through 2038. Uh, when does the Article 11 tax exemption begin and why not just have it start in uh, 2038 when the existing subsidy expires? This is an opportunity for the City of New York to obtain additional affordability on a project that could potentially opt out in future years. With the current mayor's housing plan, uh, the idea is to preserve as many units as possible for the longest period possible so the environment is conducive to this transaction happening now. What is, in, in science, uh, we, we use a, a hypothesis where we, we have the, the null statement, we have a control, so the status quo. What is the control? If we do nothing, do we lose all the affordable housing today? No. Tomorrow. The affordability would not be in jeopardy until the Article 5 expiration date. Which is in 2038. Which is, just one second. 2024. Sorry, no. 20. Yeah, 2024. Okay. So there, there is no, so the next, so, so why are we doing it now instead of in 2024? The environment in which the city is acting to preserve affordability is, this is one of the means that, the tool that they use to preserve affordability for the long term. Can I add to that? Yes, yes please. So, I'm not sure if this is on. Okay. As Councilmember Levine referred to, there are many seniors aging in place in this building, and the building doesn't produce enough income to Rehab, rehab every unit that may need to get closer to ADA standards to keep those seniors in their homes. So now, in addition to the regulatory environment being favorable and our partners at HPD seeming favorable to this Article 11 formation, we also have in place a HUD refinancing mortgage insurance commitment and a rate lock that may not exist in 2024 or further down the road. So now really is the time for many reasons to keep the tenants in place as well as to keep financing in place that enables them to stay. Yeah, and we have obviously a willing sponsor who's, you know, working with us to go through that process and, you know, we can't guarantee that that will be the case at the time the uh, other, the Article 5 expires, so why would we take the chance if we're able to guarantee this into the future now? So I, I and so then the question is, so we're doing a partial Article 11, why not start it in 2024 versus now? The 
um, the tax exemption basically starts over again. That's, that's the reality of it. The tax exemption starts over again. I'm so, not following. Uh, in other words, the formula under Article 5 is the taxes increase over time. So by restarting the tax exemption, you're lowering the taxes in year one and you're allowing the taxes to escalate as the years go out. As a result of that, the project is able to have more net operating income where it can afford the loan to do the rehab and the transaction. Okay. Some additional questions. So th the total project, what are the total project costs of uh, what you're doing? It's an $18 million loan that's all private. And in what work is making the building ADA adaptable? Are they getting an elevator? Is this a walk up? What's, what's the story here? The, um, I believe it's ADA compliant doors, bathroom subfloors, and countertops. Okay, so you have demolition of existing buildings and bathrooms. Okay, so it's expanding. So th there is an elevator, and it's expanding the bathrooms so that folks can get in with a wheelchair or other assistive device. I I I, I recognize that Council Member Levine is is well expert and has likely there, been in this building, and there, I, uh, I just want to take a moment. We we see a lot of these, and there aren't very many Council Members who are who can tell you what each apartment looks like in these developments, so that, that means a lot. Uh, okay, so there's $18 million in private project costs to do these improvements. What are the hard costs? What are the soft costs? The hard costs are, just one moment, the construction costs are are 1.6 million, the closing costs are 300,000, and the balance is um, basically purchase price. Oh, so the so 1.6 million construction costs. Uh, 3,000 in closing costs, and then 16.5 million in acquisition price. So, so there aren't really any soft costs on this project? Um, according to my budget, I have purchase price, closing costs, and construction costs. Okay. And so the construction isn't going to have, you don't have to pay architects, you don't have to pay engineers. Okay, great. Is there any uh, commercial property on this, in this no. project? No, no commercial space. Is there any HPD subsidy beyond the Article 11? No. Is there uh, any HDC uh, financing? No. Any low income housing tax credits? No. Any federal subsidies? No. State subsidies? No. Did Mark give you any money? No. <laughs> No, no, uh, it, it's a good thing. Uh, Council Member Levine has a record of putting capital member item discretionary funding into uh, affordable. affordable housing in his district. Uh, are there, is there any developer equity in this? It's developer would likely put in equity as a part of the condition of the loan. Okay, these are the questions for the developer. Uh, the rehabilitation that's going to happen, there will be construction workers who do this. Will those folks have health insurance, disability insurance, and have the ability to retire one day with a pension? The short answer is yes. The long answer is that the management company who is a partner in the deal is Metropolitan Realty. Their employees are likely to perform most of the work because it is, as you intimated, not a new construction project. It's mostly minor to medium repairs, so most of their in-house maintenance staff can perform the construction work needed, and those folks are absolutely paid a living wage at or above union scale and do receive health insurance and benefits. 
uh, and those folks also maintain the buildings, so that answers both questions. Yep. And uh, the, the next question is, uh, do for, for your definition of living wage, we have had folks come in and define living wage as the minimum wage, uh, and so will the folks who are doing this work and who work in this building be able to afford the affordable housing in this building? Will they meet a minimum of the 50% AMI? I'm okay if they exceed 50% of AMI. Right, so what I'm told is that building workers are paid at or above minimum, I'm sorry, not minimum wage, but union scale wages. So I would certainly hope that they would be at least at 50% of AMI, if not, not qualifying because of their income being too high. That is a good problem to have. That is one of the ways out of the affordable housing crisis, which is to actually pay people enough to not need to have affordable housing. Uh, do you have an MWBE commitment on this project or do you have an MWBE goal? So uh, the project is not required to have a commitment because it's not hard subsidy from the city. So I'm told that the managing agent uses MWBE and local hires as much as possible, although not all are certified MWBE in, in the case of some subcontractors, but it's certainly something that is top of mind. That is it for my questions. All excellent questions, thank you. I have nothing further to add, but uh, remain very supportive of the project. Are there any members of the public here to testify on this item? Seeing none, I close this hearing. Thank you. Our next public hearing will be on land use number 106, uh, the 501 West 51st Street application for property in Speaker Johnson's district in Manhattan. HPD seeks a new Article 11 tax exemption for a term of 40 years for a fully occupied building with 22 residential units. The building, which was once two buildings, which have now been combined, was rehabilitated previously. Some tenants were relocated during the rehabilitation have returned to the building. The rest the rehabilitated units were marketed to families with incomes of 80% of AMI. The tax exemption would re be retroactive, something that I'd love to see on another project we heard today, to 2010. It is going back eight years. Easily something we could do in another project we heard today. Since this building has existing tax arrears, very similar to another project we heard today. Uh, we'd like to open the hearing on land use item 106 uh, on the advice of our land use council. Uh, the speaker is supporting this item and uh, we will ask if HPD would consider submitting testimony into the record and we will waive the uh, hearing. On, sorry, let me just see if we have anyone in the public who's here to testify. That being said, we would, uh, if you'd agree to enter it into the record, we would waive hearing on yeah, this we're item. Not waiving hearing. We are opening the hearing if you can submit the written testimony, and then we don't close the hearing at that point. That's what the committee council said. Do you want so, to repeat that for the record? Uh, <laughs> as the committee council has advised, we will uh, open the hearing, which we have just done. Uh, if you would agree to submit the testimony, and then we will close the hearing since there is no one to testify on it. That's fine. Thank I have you. it here. I will submit it to the Sergeant at Arms. I now close the public hearing on this item. All items have been heard today and will be laid over. For I'd like to thank the council and land use staff for preparing today's hearing, the members of the public and my colleagues for attending. This meeting is hereby adjourned. <laughs>